understanding sort of of where we left last week when we were talking about what kind of feedback around the child care piece and the minimum wage bill was that after we looked at what Deb Richter put up and over ours, yeah, right. you know, Deb Brighton, oh, wrong Deb. <laughs> <laughs> Deb Brighton put up, um, we decided we wanted to keep ours. And then in further discussion, it was like, oh, but um, ours only goes out about so many. And so to layer on top what was in their bill in terms of um, making adjustments. So um, with that direction, <laughs> <laughs> and then I think we want the intent language. There were two sections. Um, Haiti drafted an amendment, which we think, um, and uh, Teresa was part of this as well, she's more organized than I am. Um, we think this is what where we came to. If it's not, fine, but this is what's up there. Okay, Katie Pittman, Office of Legislative Council. So this amendment strikes Section 3 of S23, which was the CCFAP language that was within the minimum wage bill. And instead, it puts in two new sections, a new Section 3 and a new Section 3A. The first section, the new Section 3, looks very similar to the language that you passed in H531. You have a subsection A that has intent language. Is the intent of the General Assembly that investments and initiatives set forth in this act are meant to complement the anticipated redesign of CCFAP, which shall be monitored by the General Assembly. So that language comes out of your H531. And then so I have a question. Is it set forth in this act? I mean, shouldn't it be in this section? In this section. Section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then in subsection B, this language is identical to the language that came out of H531. Um, so this is the sliding scale, the same sliding scale. And in subdivision 2, this is the market rates, um, same as what passed out of this committee. And then in section 3A, you're adding a new subdivision. Um, to the CCFAP language that's in the green books. And this language says that beginning January 1st, 2025, in each subsequent year that the minimum wage is increased thereafter, the commissioner for DCF is to amend the department's CCFAP program to do two things, adjust the sliding fee scale to correspond with each minimum wage increase in order to ensure that the benefit percentage at each new uh, minimum wage level is not lower than the percentage applied under the former minimum wage. And secondly, adjusting the rate of reimbursement on behalf of families participating in CCFAP in a manner that offsets the estimated cost of child care in Vermont resulting from the increase in wage. So in subdivision A and B, um, that language is modeled on language that is in currently in S23. Um, so in uh, so I had a discussion with the chair about this um, because our language, um, while we were enthusiastic about our language because it did in one year what the minimum wage bill would have done in five years, um, what our language didn't do is to account for the out years. So what happens after the minimum wage catches up to the changes that we're making. And so um, so we suggested a modest change, which says, could you push that up just a little yep. bit, Katie? Um, um, beginning January 1, 2025, um, which is essentially the place where um, the minimum wage increase at 15 happens by 2024, so the following January. And then every the following January, the minimum wage will be increased by the CPI. Um, and then if that bill passes the way it is, then, then the rates paid and um, the um, sliding scale would adjust with it. So the same intent as what the current language has, except for we, we sort of, from my perspective, get the 
get the best of both. So we adjust it up to what we we want to do as we pass out of here in H 531. And then this language would address it in subsequent years after that. Not sure. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Do we have any um, look back in terms of the uh, market rate changing? We brought it up to 2015 and 2017 was there. Mm -hmm. But as I mean, we're talking, we're out in 2026 now. And, uh, in that bill, we didn't have anything about that, did we? That I can remember. We didn't. Uh, it adjusts the poverty scale, poverty rate. Right. But never, never after the f adjustment for the 15th, there was no more adjustments that I remember. Well, if you recall, <coughs> the, beginning, the the first paragraph of this in our intent language. Remember, it's in the intent of 531. It's intended to be the initial year of a multi-year process. Yes. That will adjust the market rates and the payment methodology. But if that doesn't happen, which a lot of things don't happen, <laughs> then this would adjust it. If that does happen, then this would not be necessary. Okay, Trish, that's, I, I like what you're saying, but yeah. you need to, I'm like Thomas, you, know, you need to show me where, okay, where so, the language is that says the market rate is going to adjust. It's, it's right here in subdivision two. <laughs> Subdivision two. Uh huh. That's the language that you passed. Yeah, right, that's, that's how we're doing. That's how we're talking about it. Um, in section three, subdivision A. Section three, subdivision. A. Uh, it's on. It's on line the nine. The general assembly investments and initiatives are meant to complement and anticipate redesign. Redesign. Right. Of the chunk of finance. So the redesign that Reva presented to us included changing. Updating the market rates and changing the rates, um, the supplements paid um, on behalf of families. So it doesn't specifically say in 2025 we'll be at, you know, market, market rate 2023. It doesn't say that um, because it's intended to be five. 31 is intended to be the first year of a multi-year process. Yeah, I got you. you. You see what, what I do. the problem is? I do. As we get further out, the market rate stays the same. What we're doing is negated somewhat because the market rate is down. So, if, so the subsidy and all that is going to be affected. So, so let's play out worst case scenario. Go ahead. Worst case scenario is 531 passes the way it is, and there's no other changes that happen for the next five years. So the plans that Reva put out to us that had, it's, it's a multi-year, we got a whole presentation on it and how, how much of an investment would be required each year of the next four years, I think yeah. it is. So let's just say none of that happens, worst case scenario. Um, this language would enable the rates to increase consistent with the minimum wage increases of the CPI. Right. So that's a good thing. If the redesign happens, <coughs> this would not be necessary. If the market rate goes up. <laughs> but we don't, we, we're, we're depending upon what happens in fiscal year 21, 22, 23, and 24. Um, the rates that we increased in 531 are already up to the five-year level of this. So um, one might call it a little bit of belts and suspenders, as, as we use in this yeah. in this. Um, well, we're building. going to 2015, and it'll be that way for five years. Um, unless. In, unless the governor comes through with the second phase of the proposed redesign. Um, so yeah, there, there is the potential that whatever gets implemented in 531 this year doesn't change until 2025. Um, I hope that's not the case. I mean, we, you know, that's why we have that intent language up there um, about this being part of the redesign process. Um, if we'd left that out, then I think that it would be problematic, but um, but we don't know what next year is going to bring. 
I just want to make sure I understand. This is an amendment that is on 23. It's on the minimum wage bill. It's on the minimum wage bill, right. yes. On the minimum, and not proposed by us, but by. It only, is it proposed the, by we are we are making the change. What is in the minimum wage bill right now is something. Is their attempt at addressing? Okay, so this is the, our attempt to change the. And, and this wage. is and this is our attempt going. You know. Good college try, mm -hmm. but we we um, improved upon it. <laughs> but we improved upon it in the bill that we passed, and you had some interesting points. Mm -hmm. What happens after? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So this is what we would be proposing next door. Right. Yeah. And they would be incorporating it into their bill. Right. We would not be. We don't have. Possession. Correct. No, I bill. just wanted to make sure I realized we understood what and, we were doing there. Okay. And um, yeah. And it doesn't change anything that we did. Correct. Sure. Correct. 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 And it reinforces what we have done before. Right. Mm -hmm. So are we, we going to try and vote on this amendment? Well, uh, you know, um, this will be one of these. I'm going to ask people to raise their hand and are they okay with this? And then one of us will go over and present this to them as the um, our proposal. I mean, our proposed amendment, rather than doing it on the floor. Yeah. But rather have this part of their package, and then people don't feel. So, so, so in other words, I'm not asking anyone here at the, to be making a, um, sta a statement about the minimum wage bill. It is this section of the minimum wage bill that deals with the benefits clip. Sounds good. We think they got yeah. you. I like this one, actually. <laughs> Am I right about all of that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. Um, oh, thank you. Not as I am. <laughs> so, um, a thought. Yeah. Um, you've stuck on this that you pointed out on page one, mm -hmm. line 10, set forth in this act. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm thinking that the investments and initiatives would also, that are supposed to come oh, yeah, we in, were put that in, but that should also re be reflective of the new section 3A. So, I think instead of switching out set forth in this section, we should say set forth in this section and section 3A of this act to refer back to both of them. Okay. Okay. It would be possible just to go through it once quickly just so we can read it for sure. us and call it up. Okay. Um, so what this language proposes to do is to strike section three of the minimum wage bill, which was it's the their attempt to yes, which was their C C FAP language. And instead it puts in two new sections, a new section three and a new section three A. Section three uh, basically is taken right from your H five thirty one. So um, <laughs> subsection B of section three is a complete cut and paste from, from your section three of H531. And what we've done is just add a, a subsection A with Where's some that? intent language. See. So starting at B, subsection B in right. fiscal year 2020, that, um, that whole subsection is just a cut and paste from H531. And then the A that appears above it, that's also from H531. It's just from a different section. So that's your intent language. And this is establishing, this is the appropriation um, to amend the sliding T scale and CC FAP. That's what subdivision one is right here. And then if you remember, we have this list of yeah. subdivisions A through D, which are the different points where the sliding right. B scale is moving. Subdivision two is the um, market rates, adjusting the market rates. And then there's the new section 3A, and this is the language about corresponding movements in the sliding fee scale and the market rates um, based on whether there's a change in minimum wage after 2025. And um, Katie, 
you're going to adjust the first paragraph? No. I'm going. You're going to adjust on the line, section 3A. Yes, on line 10, where it says set forth in this act, I'm going to say set forth in this section and section 3A of this act. This is kind of a separate question. But so does the full minimum wage, the $50, <coughs> come at 2025? Is that the year? That's 2024. Sorry, 2024. So why then do we need to put in the January 1st? Because that's the next year. That's the following year. That's when there'll be a COLA. That's when there'll be a COLA based on CPI. Oh, to get us back on to the cycle that we wanted to be on in the bill. In our, right. in and, our and, bill. Well, it keeps in the going. minimum wage bill, big jumps, or not jumps, and then COLA. And then right? Oh, so and then it starts. The, okay, so because it continues what we're doing now. Okay. Yeah. okay. Right I, now, I our, we, we increase our minimum wage every year based on COLA. This sort of does a jump start there. Okay. And then it stays. So it's not really session law then, this is real law, is that right? Because it would seem like if it ended in 2024 and then it would be session law, right? So this isn't in session law, this would be in the green books that new language, okay. right? Yep. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so can we present, can I show of hands in terms of presenting this to next door as what we would like them to substitute? With the understanding it doesn't mean to commit us to the bill itself. Uh, right. Absolutely. That's yeah. why yeah. here at yeah. the uh, uh, Carl, there is a rhyme to my reason. There is a rhyme to my reason. Uh, I have my left hand on how to say she didn't notice. When you're right hand crossed. Um for you. I don't know how uh, maybe to could you um as in as a memo to, um, sure. you know, that thank you for the opportunity to let us review this section. Mm -hmm. um, Here's a book. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. appreciate it. Um, great job. Yes, everyone. Great job, Mary Beth. Yeah. Oh. Real Great job, job Jessica. Mm -hmm. It was no, awesome. I saw everybody's mm -hmm. comments that stood and, up with um, me. As we had done the child care bill, we were in the process. I know. I wonder what happened. It got pulled What I think is, I mean, it was it was a, a um, it, it was a fair, perhaps, comment um, that it's important and it's fine. It's what it's what we did with child care to put out facts. There was a nice little thing, a nice little graphic that had kids, but this was sort of the outlining of this is what the bill does, and this, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. This is how the bill solves the problem. Mm -hmm. um, the hand, the handout that was beautiful. Here, I have it. Um, the handout that was beautiful um, uh, veers towards advocacy. Oh, yeah, well, that picture, that he <laughs> does. Yes. So. Um, Say that this is right, by by an advocacy group as opposed to sort of a factual summary. Um, and I take some responsibility for not because um, Mary Beth Mary Beth shared that with me. And I thought, oh, lovely. Made a few other. It did not occur to me, and so she spent lots of time with making it. Um, yeah whatever so I um, but I still think and everyone still goes back to the idea of letting on you know on multi bills to put put it out there on people's desks so they know what they're doing and they know that um, so when they the go office. home they can answer questions and so when they, yeah, when they go yeah. home they can answer questions if they if happen to not be in the floor wrapped attention on things they can go back to that the, um, the other thing, just a learning experience, which um, Mary Beth and I learned too, is that we had put at the bottom of it a little um, thing that said that we, um, it showed the three pronged effort and it had each of the bills. And what the clerk told us is that you can't 
talk about other bills on the floor by number. Right. So we had to take that out this morning. That was sort of the oh, fire drill earlier today. Yeah. No, and in my presentation, I hadn't used the numbers. I just talked about what the three prongs were, but in general, they were listed on the flyer. But it's just good for all of us yeah. to know. I mean, that, yeah. that's another little thing to just keep in mind when you're preparing. So had you guys sort of like set up the one, two thing? The three prompt? You know, the adjutant in general thing? Uh, no, no, but but how it was, was I thought you were gonna include it. In I was, but no. then it was put on it the on the flyer. Line, so it I didn't have it in my and then oh. Ann texted me. I, I, but you I, stood I, up and talked about yeah. it. I texted Mary Beth and said if there's a lot of chatter. Would you do the quote? Mm -hmm. Mary Beth, being a good team player, <laughs> texted <laughs> Jessica to say, "Are you okay with that?" And I didn't see that because <laughs> no. I wasn't listening to my phone. Don't, uh -huh. don't say that out loud too much. <laughs> I was just wondering because I was in a curious. roll call vote. No, 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 it wasn't. No, it was this one. Was it during the roll call? Okay. No, no, yeah, it was this one. It was the best representative. This was the best. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you didn't make any. No, yeah. And it was fine. And what was the final vote? I, I, uh, one, one, two, four, fourteen. Right. I remember the fourteen. And, I mean, I, you know, I, um, there are fourteen people who voted no, and um, I don't know. I don't know if, if Mary Best's comment has um, preempted an amendment about the military or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there. Um, there was some talk that there might be some amendments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so it's so um, you know you can breathe easy and just know that tomorrow it may not be like some other of our bills that have um, that the day that the second day on the floor has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, goes. And the uh, I talked to Brian just a little bit, because he's still, and I know we just spoke with Sandy as well, about the indigenous people. And I said, you know, it's 20, right now in current law, it's $25 if they were, and they would never go after, you know, if you had tobacco or leave. Um, and he agreed, but he's still talking to the chief of some group, and he may come in tomorrow, but I'm hoping that I have some influence along with Sandy to not have him do that. And um, the other thing is I did talk to uh, Representative LeClaire, and he told me there wasn't going to be a military exemption unless today they changed their mind. So. And uh, I was a little confused, but maybe it was just because it was informally offered. Representative Young's amendment was informally offered. Okay. Because when he... Um, on Friday, he said, I'm not putting it in the calendar okay. because maybe I won't offer it. Gotcha. And so. Of course, he would want to vote. Right, right, right. Do, do note, mm -hmm. do note that he did vote against the bill. Yeah. I was actually surprised that he voted for the bill in Ways and Means because he was a no um, years ago. It might be worth checking with him one more time because when I went to leave, he mentioned that he was thinking, still thinking about it. So. Well, so the calendar will probably go by five or so. Yeah. So just go online and look at the calendar. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. not the end of the world, but right. it's a story. Right. right. OK. And it wasn't just Republicans that said no. Yeah. Oh, no. No, no, no. This is a, this is a, this is a, ter a tripartisan yes, a tripart yeah. tripartisan and uh, mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> this is a drip yes and no. <laughs> what's, a, what's a four? Oh, a drip. I think I can put drip. How do you say Yeah, but we're not a party, so you can't. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're not the big capital. They're an association. <laughs> we're not that either. I wonder if they can have a health plan. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Um, so our, I know we have something else coming up. Uh huh. Why? Regulation of cannabis. That's why I'm eating <laughs> cannabis. <laughs> so um, just uh, so there's another there's another section or proposed amendment yeah. in the minimum wage bill that has to do with our area of jurisdiction. And mm -hmm. I just didn't know if we were going to have an opportunity to review that. Um. 
if you think we should. Um, I haven't seen, I, I've seen many different drafts of language um, that I have not seen. I mean, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, so I don't know. What is the upset? I mean, it's interesting because we, we were, <coughs> we were both sort of asked and inserted ourselves both in, in terms of the child care piece, because it was in the bill as it came over. Um, and amendments that happen, I mean, things that get added to the bill in there get, yes. so I think nothing that's, I mean, there's, you know, nothing that says we can or can't or um, accept what we have on our plate. Um, you know. I mean, if it gets in, kind of thing. Otherwise, I would say individuals advocate okay. real strongly. Well, that's what I was. Yeah. Um, for folks who don't, um, yeah, that was kind of cryptic. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, there, there is talk. I mean, and if you if you read your um, your summaries from the Home Health Agency, mm -hmm. um, it's it's in draft language. Yeah. They are um, they are oh. proposing. Um, to do some kind of um, addressing of the Medicaid issue uh, for uh, home care providers, et cetera. So that's where that is. So we are waiting for Michelle. We won't be, this won't be our last day of, of, of doing this, and we will, um, as we are, um, today we're just getting, I'm not sure we'll get the whole work, we're getting a walkthrough of the cannabis um, bill, is. and there she is in sections of it in particular. Um, and then <laughs> we have, um, we've just gotten uh, an email from the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health about it. Um, you know, our focus is on medical marijuana and the public health um, you know, sort of implications or not thereof. Um, and so we may be having um, a commissioner squirrel come in. And I was maybe you know thinking if there's someone who's maybe not attached to the current administration, so because just to sort of do that. Um, can we post this so we can find it? Of course. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to losing it <laughs> in my secret. I, absolutely. She was going to put it with her coffee. <laughs> so maybe some of my... Hi. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Come on. Come on. Come on up. Um, and I do... Um, I apologize um, to, to let you know, Michelle, there will be a few people who are um, leaving for a few minutes at two just because there's a bill being signed that is important to them. I will not be offended. Okay. As I, I, I just wanted to give you sort of a, a heads up. And if it's too much of a critical mass, we may have to take an unplanned okay. break. Sure. So for the record, Michelle Child's Office of Legislative Council, and we're going to be discussing S-54 today. Um, so, uh, um, and Michelle, some of us have a hard time hearing. Okay. Does the microphone help? No, that's Not the really. taping. That's just for the taping. Okay, yeah. I'll make sure that I took my retainers out, so hopefully I can project a little <laughs> <better. Okay. laughs> Um So uh, we're going to be t discussing S-54, and I think as you already know, um, it's right across the hall in government operations. We've been working on it for a few weeks. And um, the chair sent letters to four different committees, uh, including this one, asking um, other committees to take a look at certain provisions in there and make recommendations to government operations. For uh, And they asked 
you as human services committee to specifically look at the provisions of the bill that deal with the medical registry program and the regulation of dispensaries. So just as a, I'm going to give you kind of start in broad kind of strokes here and kind of try to set up the framework for the discussion. Then you let me know if I'm going off in a in the wrong direction. Uh, um, it may not have been in your excuse me in her email. She also she informally said that she'd be look she'd be very happy to have us look at advertising. Okay. Um, and in my cursory review quickly of the bill. Um, the three people who were make up the cannabis board and who they are and their qualifications would be something that this committee would be interested in okay. considering. So there is a, um, they have not uh, taken it up yet, but I am in the process, as you can imagine, of working on a, uh, a big uh, government operations uh, committee amendment, and there are things that in their amendment that they have not reviewed yet, but that they will do tomorrow that have obviously changed since what came over from the Senate and things like the composition of the board and some provisions on advertising as well. So on things that um, perhaps that you want to discuss, it might be that are not in the medical program, it might be better if I can then get you the gov ops oh, stuff. That way you're not kind of starting back with Senate right. version when they've already yeah. kind of tended to move past that already. Right. This, is, this is a work in progress. Okay. Um, so uh, so generally, um, what I what I want, let me see, pull up here, see what's on here already, if there's any. So I think I'm going to start out with a timeline here. So for folks, so you should be able to go into the witness list and have a timeline. So I want to just talk about the bill generally because I'm, I'm guessing from a time perspective, you don't want me to walk through the bill. You want me to give you a summary of it? Um, at present, we may come back. Okay. Because um, the intersection of so many aspects of this bill with medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. From what is a public place? Is it the same definition? <coughs> you know, a closed space? I mean, there's definitions in here, and are they the same as what is currently in law? So there's, but right now, I think, to give us, to center us is a good right. place I'll to start. I'll just give you an overview. You can certainly go back and walk through the proposal, but I would say that it probably to do a whole walkthrough that maybe I would work off of what government operations is, is working off of at this point instead of the ask pass by Senate version. Um, but just generally in thinking about this, so as you know, because um, you guys have dealt with this issue through the years, is um, we have a current uh, medical uh, marijuana registry that's in its um, within the Department of Public Safety. It's regulated by the Department of Public Safety. They also regulate the dispensary. You adopted um, the medical dispensary law in 2004, so you've had it for about 15 years. Um, and on that, patients can register with the Department of Public Safety. Um, uh, they get a. Uh, they have to have a debilitating medical condition that's defined in the law. They um, have their health care provider, who they have a at least a three-month health care provider patient relationship. That health care provider can sign a medical verification form attesting that that patient of theirs has a debilitating medical condition that is defined in law. And so it's not a prescription, it's a, it's a, a confirmation that the person has this particular condition. And then the patient submits that with their application, the person can be on the registry. Um, the reg when the registry started, um, possession of cannabis was illegal across the board, so this was an exemption out of those laws when it passed in 2004. What you saw in 2013 was the General Assembly decriminalized possession of an ounce or less for adults 21 years and older. And then last year, there was the adoption of H-511, which took effect July 1st, which removed all penalties, including civil penalties, for possession of an ounce or less of, can of cannabis for adults 21 years of age and older. It also, 511 allows people to grow two mature plants and up to four immature plants. So the difference with patients is that there's still an advantage to being on the registry, even in the H post-511 world, is that patients um, can have two mature and seven immature, so they can have three additional immature plants. Also, patients can have um, uh, 
two ounces in addition to their plants, and also they can are the only ones who can access medical cannabis dispensaries. Um, caregivers can as well. You can be a registered caregiver for a patient um, also on the registry. So right now, patients and caregivers are the only ones who are allowed to access the dispensaries. Um, what S54 does is it sets up a new regulatory authority, which would be the Cannabis um, Control Board. And this would be um, the body that would work on establishing the new kind of commercial system and going through and, and doing the build out of how it would be regulated, adop adoption of the rules. And they would be doing it not just for the commercial system, but they would also be doing it for the medical system as well. Because if you think about it, so right now we have a whole system of you know, certain criteria in order to be able to be a patient on the registry and to access the services and goods at a dispensary. Um, but if you have a system whereby basically you're uh, licensing other businesses to be able to sell retail, and you have someone that is um, a patient and they can walk into a retail store and purchase cannabis and cannabis products, um, it forces you to look at the, the, the limitations and, the, and um, things that are around the medical program right now because they may be kind of inconsistent. So an example might be, like right now, a, a patient, in order to go to the dispensary, they have to make an appointment. They have to designate a particular dispensary. They can't go to all of them, any which one. They have to let the DPS know which ones they're going to go to, and they have to make an appointment to go. So Sort of like our pharmacies. Some of us can only, you know, our insurance will only reimburse a certain, you know, has a special relationship with certain pharmacies. Um, and um, so then the question is, is um, if that same person could walk into a, a retail cannabis store and purchase products, mm -hmm. does it still make sense from a policy perspective to require that, that same person, if they're going to go to a dispensary to obtain cannabis from a medical dispensary, to have to designate only one store or to make an appointment? So there's kind of, you have to look at the medical program at the same time that you're looking at the commercial program. That's a great question. Then it's kind of a little bit behind and range it too far ahead. Sure. So right now, if you and I wasn't on this committee before, so some of these are a little bit old. But right now, if you are in the medical program, you is that considered a prescription? No. Okay. So that's not a prescription. You you just it's run differently. No, you can't. So, federal law preempts the states from, from doing that. So it's it's simply a your healthcare provider is signing a form that is a verification that you know I've had this relationship with this patient, I've done a physical examination, I know their medical history, and they have MS. They have what whatever is the qualifying condition. And, and that one might be helpful to them. Or, right. No, they don't have. They don't have to decide. No. Or, no. Okay. They don't do that. They, they don't. Say, okay. No, they, they don't have to be recommending okay. marijuana. They are just doing the verification of the illness. Okay. The underlying so, illness. Right. right. They don't have so to that, agree or any of that. So the prescription piece right now. It's not, not a prescription. I know it's not. But then I have another question around prescriptions. So okay. right now, though, in Vermont, if you need a prescription for an antibiotic, you can't tax that. Right, so then this would mean that in the medical marijuana world, because it's not a prescription, it will be taxed the same way as no uh, cannabis products. and cannabis products currently that are sold by dispensaries are not taxed, and under S54 they would not be taxed either. So under S54, the proposal is that um, cannabis and cannabis products that will be sold retail in a commercial system would be subject to a 16% excise tax and a potential 2% local option, but anything that a patient or caregiver purchases from a dispensary would continue to be untaxed. It's just an interesting thing, because now we're going to open, if, we, if this law opens it up a little, it, it makes it, wouldn't everybody want to go to a medical dispensary because it wouldn't be taxed? I guess you'd still need, I mean, you'd still need the physician. The, you still need the physician, and, okay. and you know we can make our comment around that, but that and that is really a ways and means um, okay. issue in terms of taxation. But uh, you know, on the one hand, we're like, oh, see, we're opening this up. Mm -hmm. 
mix it so, we should, but on the other hand, we want to treat it separately. So, okay, okay, I just wanted to understand the past versus where we're headed. Thank you. So, um, again, talking just big picture about, about the role of so the Cannabis Control Board. So government operations is, has, is looking at having it be a five-member board. And so having an additional appointment, in addition to the governor appointing the chair, the Senate and the House each members, they would also have the treasurer and the attorney general appoint members to, uh, to the board. And this board would essentially be kind of coming together in the fall, hiring an executive director and administrative assistant. And then they've got a whole host of things that they've got to do um, right off the bat. And they're going to, um, the big lift there is going to be at the beginning, starting the to draft rules for the commercial program and the, the, and the medical program, which also includes the regulation of dispensaries. So and I guess we'll have to look at that one with their amendment. <clears throat> um, for government operations is, well, the bill as it comes over, um, maintains medical uh, medical marijuana as well as a commercial marijuana they um, the bill proposes to do away with the current regulatory structure yes. um, of medical marijuana and replace that with the cannabis control board and there is no one on the cannabis control board that has any kind of public health there is not a requirement with regard to specifics about who those appointing bodies about what the requirements be as a person Well, I mean, and, and, and there's no appointing body that references public health or health. I mean, so, no, so you have the medical, I mean, I'm just, I mean, if that's if that is really, I mean, we don't see it, but from what I just heard you say, right, is that there would be five members. Um, there is a requirement that they are to um, establish an advisory commission, and so that is where I think people have an interest in saying advisory commission shall have folks on there with business and regulatory experience or social justice issues or public health or those types of things, I think is what the discussion is going on in the is that being specific about um, having certain subject matter expertise being in the advisory commission, but not tying the five board member positions to a particular field is the conversation going on right now. Yeah. Um. And um, I guess no discussion then, or, or maybe discussion in the advisory board about, uh, it, sorry, I'm not formulating this very well. Um, we have several years of experience now in the medical marijuana administration under public safety, and I understand the Senate's desire to move that out. I'm just um, wondering that we've learned a considerable amount, one might think, um, about uh, from our experience there, and it doesn't seem to be represented anywhere. It's, I guess it's, I'm making more of a comment. That's not a question, thank you. <laughs> I think maybe once I can kind of scope out the different pieces, it might start to, maybe yeah, it, it might yeah, answer some, okay. of, some of y'all's questions about, about this. Okay. Is that, so from, just going back to the timing of it, so the board is gonna be kind of coalescing in the fall, um, working on regulations. They're also um, going to, they're going to be coming back to the General Assembly in next January with recommendations for the second and third fiscal year build out for the program because the positions and appropriations that are created in S54 are only dealing with FY20 and not dealing with the second and third year. Um, pieces of that. They're also going to be coming back in January for a recommendation on fee structures because there are five, and there are going to be five different types of licenses that people can apply for in the new commercial system. So it's a cultivator, a wholesaler, a product manufacturer, a retailer, and a testing laboratory. And so people will be able to uh, obtain one of each, but no more than one. So um, right now, currently, under the dispensary program, they are vertically integrated, which means they can do everything from you know, plant the seed to sale to patients and caregivers. They would continue to be able to be vertically integrated under one license, but that's not how it would work in the commercial system. If somebody wants to do that, they would have to have one of each of the different five types of licenses, but they could have no more. So um, it couldn't be, you couldn't have you know, one of those kind of big West Coast companies that has 
you know, franchises out there and multiple stores and things like that. They could only have like each person only have one retail store. Um, and so the so the board will be recommending a fee structure because there'll be tiers within each type of license, and so they'll be coming back in January for that. Um, then uh, there are then they're going to start formal rulemaking um, at the beginning of next year, and that's going to take some time. Um, they're going to, as I mentioned, they're going to be doing the rulemaking for the medical and the commercial at the same time, so that hopefully, you know, there's going to be a lot of overlap in terms of, you know, what makes sense, and then with making distinctions between the two programs where that's appropriate. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to think what matters to you guys. Um, the, and in terms of the medical programs, they are not due to shift over from the Department of Public Safety to the board until January 1st of 2021. So the dispensaries and the registry will continue to operate under DPS while um, the board kind of gets its, its footing under them and they go through the whole rulemaking process. And so those programs wouldn't shift. Um, something that uh, they're discussing across the hall, but they haven't signed off on, but I can, uh, but I'll, so I don't know how much you want me to talk about it. One of the things they're considering is allowing um, dispense, existing dispensaries, of which there are currently five licensees, um, to be able to do early sales to the, to the public um, prior to the whole new commercial system coming online. And so the way that that would work is that um, this summer, uh, a, an existing licensee could apply to the Department of Public Safety for what would be a temporary permit to sell cannabis and cannabis products to the public. Um, and so that would, uh, if they were able to get the license, they would get the license the later part of this year, and then they would gear up and they could start selling um, cannabis and cannabis products to the public, in addition to their services to patients and caregivers, um, they could do that essentially from July 1st of 2020 until September 1st of 2021, at which time that temporary license would expire, and that's when the retail commercial sales start. So it is something that would only be uh, on a temporary basis, the dispensaries would have to pay a $75,000 fee each um, for that temporary license. That fee would go into the Cannabis Regulation Fund that's established for 54, which is to support the new commercial system. So the way that 54 is structured that came over from the Senate is that all the fees that are collected for application for licenses, for annual licenses, all that goes into the Cannabis Regulation Fund. The tax money, as it's structured from the Senate, all goes to the general fund, um, with the exception of the local tax goes back to the local folks. And, um, but there is no, and the issue is that you have a hole basically in the fund at the, at the beginning of all of the regulatory work. And so with the early sales, you have money coming in from the temporary permits going into the Canvas Regulation Fund to support the work of the board getting the commercial system up and running. And then that year period, that year and two month period where dispensaries would be selling to the public, the 16% excise tax would also go to the fund to kind of fill the hole for until you start seeing revenue coming in from the public sales under the commercial system of, as of September 1st, 2021. Um, during the early sales, would uh, medical patients and the rest of the public be going into the same physical space? The dispensary. What are the? I have. We have got language on that, and one of one of the things is that um, they're allowed to dispensary would be, would be allowed to have a different location to serve the public if that works, because it might be that where they serve patients now might not. I mean, maybe there's not enough parking. Maybe there's because when we see it with other states, there tends to be long lines and that sort of thing. So there are accommodations in the language around ensuring that dispensaries continue to meet the needs of patients and caregivers. So it would it does things like says that uh, those folks wouldn't have to make an appointment, but they still would be able to make an appointment, that dispensaries have to make sure that, that patients are served in a way that like it's, you know, in other states, it's kind of like there can be a line down the block for 
for commercial, but if you're a patient, you have a card, you go right to the front of the line kind of a thing. So there's a prioritization of serving the patients in a, if they're doing both. Um, but it's not required that they be co-located. Um, so it could be a, a separate location. One of the, um, is that? Into yeah. Yeah. Talk. I'm trying to get figure out. Um, in there somewhere it says total of five stores only. For under existing law? No, under this. Under this, yes. Yep. So it says a total of five. We know For the temporary, yep. <coughs> because there's five licensees now and they could be limited to only having one point of sale to the public. Right. Now yep. does that total of five stores statewide? Here it is here. Okay, so that, that's, when it goes statewide, other than the dispensary on the temporary license, are there gonna be more than five? Once the full commercial system is up and running, It'd be more than there's five. no limitations in the bill, it's gonna be up to the board. Okay. So they'll consider a number of factors, and one of them is geographic distribution, so, you know, if, if they've got, um, yeah. Well, All the applicants let me, are in. Yeah, I gotta leave, so I just want to get my sure. thing out. Um, right now, we have the five dispensaries, the satellite offices too, mm -hmm. satellite places. Are they going to be allowed to sell the cannabis on a temporary basis through those satellites? They might be allowed to sell out of one of the satellites, but there's only five licenses, five Right. medical licenses, so there can only, each license is entitled to have one location for, for public sales during the temporary period. So if they have two spots that they currently serve patients, they're going to have to pick one. They're going to have to pick one, or it could be that they say, well, neither one of those is really, um, maybe they d decide that they don't want to be commingling sales to the public with their services to their patients. They might choose a completely different location, and as long as they get approval from the municipality where they're going to do that, then they could have a separate location, but only one. You mentioned that one of the differences is that medical patients have to have an appointment. Mm -hmm. Is that in the law or is that in the operating procedures? That's in statute. They have to make an appointment to go? Mm -hmm. Is the, um, you mentioned the medical marijuana, um, they will have this year, approximately a little more than a year mm -hmm. period of time when they can sell to the public. Right. Is the thinking that the medical dispensaries would kind of segue into the regular consumer retail market? Um, if, if they want to continue doing sales to the public, they would, at the time that they're, that they're operating under that temporary permit, in addition to their medical mm -hmm. you know, registration, they would have to apply just like everybody else mm -hmm. for either, you know, for whichever licenses of, of those five that they want. Because uh, at September 1st, 2021, that, that temporary is going to be gone. Mm -hmm. So they will have to have queued up to be ready that if they want to continue retail sales after that, they will have to have obtained a new retail license from the board that will pick up. So, so, so Michelle, I apologize. Committee, I apologize um, for reminding. When I look around the room, we have no R's. Um, oh, here, and I'm not comfortable having, especially in this topic, um, continuing um, our education and understanding without um, the full representation. Without full representation. So I want to say it's a um, bill signing. So why don't we assume a 15-minute break? Although I know we'd only have you till like 2:45 or something. Um, I can be here longer. Okay. It's, I think you guys have something on the schedule, but I can adjust. Oh, no, okay. Well, you know, I mean, we may be taking our break now as opposed to three at 2.45, because at 3 o'clock we get to hear about pre-K. Mm -hmm. So let's take, like, a 15 minute. 2.15. 2.15. 5.31, still under discussion. They said they're going to vote it out. It's an important bill. They have to get it out this week. Um, they have a number. I don't know what the number is. 
Oh, but it's not our number. That's what I'm going to presume since it's, since they have a number. I don't know. I'm trying to think. I saw an article on it. Or something. The, yes, the governor asked them to cut it back by millions. Oh, really? But by million? Mm -hmm. Was, well, I, I, whatever I was, article I was reading, it, they didn't talk about that, but they said they were adjusting or something. Like that. There was, yes, there was an article in Digger about that, but then yeah. there was some, uh, I don't know, some correspondence from the governor's office that came out over the weekend. Yeah, um, if you go on the joint fiscal web page, um, there is, and you click on appropriations, there's a copy of the letter that he sent, Senate appropriations, about. Oh, right, that's what I read. And yeah. um, I, of course, because I'm so good with math, it's like, no, we really are not over what you actually initially wrote. Yeah. We just oh, okay. took some money from somewhere else and put it there. Well, because you can't really tell if the 2.5 in the quote-unquote Western grants yeah. is really in his proposal or not. Because if you take that out, well, it's still. It's still. Yeah, it's still. Okay. Anyways, um, so I don't, by, they say by Thursday. We need you to go in there and talk to them. Oh, man. I, yeah. I can tell you how much influence I have in the Senate. <laughs> well, do you know how many Republicans are on that? One. One. No. Yeah. Well, there's not very many Republicans in the Senate. Really? <laughs> have you noticed that? Teresa. Teresa. Say that again. I mean. Perhaps because um, I supported the governor on the lead bill. Maybe. You might. You might. <laughs> 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 you should go talk to the governor. Yeah, you can talk to him. That's a good idea. <laughs> oh, God. No, I just shook my head. He said, thanks a lot on the lead bill, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I have I've just been told that I'm in charge, so welcome back, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, so you were, you were kind of sure, walking just, us through Sure, just do that. So, um, so in thinking again, kind of big picture, is the idea is that dispensaries and, and medical registry would continue to operate under the Department of Public Safety until January 1st of 2021. At that same time, the new Board of Cannabis Control is getting the rules adopted for the new commercial system and the new medical program, including dispensaries at the same time, getting that up. <laughs> there also is the potential that the dispensaries, while still being regulated by DPS, may apply for and receive a temporary license to, in addition to serving patients and caregivers, they may receive a license to have one location, either at an existing place or a separate location, to be able to sell cannabis and cannabis products to the public from July 1st of 2020 until September 1st of 2021 when commercial retail sales go live and then that, then that temporary license would go away. Um, so with regard to, like Teresa, you had mentioned, well, there's this expertise that's been built up within DPS. So as I mentioned, only the first fiscal year, so fiscal year 20, is contemplated in here in terms of the positions and appropriations and things like that, because you don't have any money actually coming in until that um, FY21 in terms of the commercial system with people applying and paying fees to get the new types of licenses. Um, and so, but the board is going to come back this January to the legislature and say, this is what we're going to need for the second year. Once we start accepting all these applications, once we need to start going and doing site inspections for licensees, once we need to do compliance checks, once we need to do all those things. And so they're going to come and they're going to make recommendations. One of the things that they may very well do is they're going to say, well, with the medical program shifting over from DPS into the board, it, like in the middle of FY22 is they may say we're going to recommend that you take those positions that are currently in DPS, you shift them to the board, maybe you reconfigure them, whatever it is. And so I think they're probably going to be, you know, the board is going to be working hand in hand with DPS and existing regulators who are, are running the programs to kind of on how they're going to get up the new program because they're going to you know, make sense to borrow all the stuff that's working well with regard to the registry the dispensary to look how to integrate that into the new system and some of those positions may be maybe coming over as well at some point but that's not in here because that's out a little ways 
So um, I, you're kind of in a, a, the odd position of having to give us information about what other committees are doing. So I appreciate okay. that. I appreciate that. Um, so um, I'm intrigued by the creation of the whole cannabis control board, like a, a separate board. So, you know, it, it sort of sounded to me like the Green Mountain Care Board, only for cannabis. And um, I, I just I'll put that there. I have mixed feelings about that whole thing. Um, and so. It, can you elaborate a little bit on what the thought was about not using an existing governmental structure? Sure. Um, so I think if you look over the last um, few years with some of these TNR bills, um, uh, sorry, oh, tax, tax and regulate. Right? Sorry. Um, I used to. I think I started drafting my first tax and regulate bills probably you know I don't know 18, 19 years ago, but they used to be short form. Thank, thank. Appreciate that from the sponsor at the time, <laughs> um, but they've been, you know, they've been evolving over the years, and so you started to see them really, um, uh, really start to be built out and gain traction in the in like uh, in like 2013, 2014, and I think the 15, 16 session was when you had S95 and S241, S241, which passed the Senate a few times, and um, and so the first iterations were looking at having um, a system within the Department of Public Safety, since they're the current regulators for the medical program. Um, but, uh, you know, I think people just kind of felt, well, do we, is that the right home? Once we kind of expand it from something that, you know, the, the discussion about cannabis and the policy on cannabis has been evolving over the last several years, right? right? Rather than like when, it, like when I first started working on this, it was, I, I'm the person who's always handled cannabis for the office because it was firmly always criminal and I do criminal law. And then what started happening is then it's going into the medical realm, then it's being decriminalized, uh, then it's being legalized, now it's being discussed more as a commodity, all, all more akin to alcohol and tobacco and other regulated commodities rather than being firmly in the criminal realm. And so people were thinking, well, does it really still, you know, initially the medical program was placed in the Department of Public Safety because out of concerns that you had a Schedule One drug that it was otherwise completely illegal to, and criminal to possess in this state, which it is no longer for certain amounts. And so there's been a shift in, the, in just the dialogue about cannabis. And so I think then there was the, the determination, and, and it, I don't think I'm going to freeze here, but I was going to say, I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying DPS wasn't super psyched, actually, about their, it's not what we do, um, necessarily. They weren't um, uh, thrilled about the idea of being commercial regulators um, for cannabis industry at the, at the time. And so then there was discussion, well, if it's not there, where should it be? Well, then there was discussion, maybe it should be in the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets, because they do you know cultivation of, of plants and bringing things to market and maybe it should be there and there were discussions and there were proposals and probably a few things passed the Senate with it being in the Agency of Agriculture but then because it touches on a lot of different issues people thought well it doesn't just really belong in Ag either um, DLL was certainly considered but DLL. The de uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery um, but that's different because um, we have a con we're a control state and um, and so the uh, the way that that works is we actually the state is in possession of the alcohol and distributes the alcohol, which is something that um, our office has advised against when it comes to cannabis. Because while um, we have treated it differently under state law, at the federal level, it's still considered a Schedule One drug under the Controlled Substances Act, and there are severe penalties for possession and distribution. And um, and those that exist now, and the federal government could choose to take some type of enforcement action against anybody who's engaged in the cannabis business now, um, but we don't really see that. There's been something, um, there's been a provider on the uh, Federal Department of Justice um, uh, Appropriations um, money um, for the last few years that specifically says that DOJ cannot use any of its budget to um, come down on states' medical cannabis programs. Um, and so that's been a restriction as far as the medical programs 
they could choose, but it's really just a, it's up to the feds about whether or not they want to choose to enforce the CSA. So all those states out west, you get the whole entire west coast that has a regulated market. It's just up to the feds about whether or not they're going to choose to take any enforcement action. CSA. Somebody. Yes. No. Oh, say, oh, Controlled Substances Act. Federal. Yep, we're, sorry. We're, we're, we don't have all the other. Yes, yeah, so I will. I will. Mm -hmm. I will remember that. Um, and so, so certainly, my recommendation to to you guys as my clients is, you know, I think with with having such large markets, regulated markets currently in operation, probably Vermont. You know, little Vermont, if you have a regulated commercial market, probably isn't going to be at the top of that enforcement list. But if you all of a sudden, if the state has big warehouses of cannabis, like it does with alcohol, and then the state and state workers are engaged in distributing that cannabis, I think it might be a different, a different equation. So, um, so the DLL model doesn't really fit. I mean, so because it's kind of, it seems as though there's different agencies within the state that have little pieces, um, legislators in both, the, it was in, obviously in the Senate bill, but also in, there was a House bill, H-196, that a, a lot of folks signed on to, and it was the same there, as they looked and said, well, Massachusetts has a different model, whereas they created a, an independent um, agency, an independent commission. So the um, the Cannabis Control Commission in, in Massachusetts, so that is independent, it has appointments the way that this one does, and that they operate, so they're an independent executive branch agency, essentially. Um, and that they would um, work with other agencies and departments to kind of collaborate, take information, they'll be more collaborative with ag, with maybe they can, you know, learn from training and compliance from DLL, learn from DPS on, you know, the experience of regulating the dispensaries and all stuff and pull all that information together and then they are, there's language in S54 that says, you know, with it, when it comes to rulemaking, they're to be consulting with these other agencies and collaborating when there's specific expertise. I imagine when the ED comes back to the General Assembly and talks about, you know, this is what we need for year two and year three build out. Um, they're going to try to use existing resources in state government. You know, one example would be using the agriculture laboratory. So, um, so you have this ag lab that I think is just now getting going, and so um, this board is going to want it, it's going to be requiring compliance testing. So there's a lot of, of language in S54 that requires testing at different points in in the chain of cannabis, right, before it comes to consumers, and. Um, and, uh, and so each different type of licensee is going to have certain types of, of requirements for testing. And they're going to be required to do their own testing. And they may contract with a, test, a licensed testing lab to do that for themselves. But the, the regulatory body is going to want to do spot checking and, and compliance checking. And they may say, well, doesn't it make, we don't want to duplicate services, so we want to utilize the services of the ag lab for that. And, and so they're coming up for a proposal. So they're, you know, they're not going to kind of recreate things that already exist. They're going to try to link into existing systems. And the concern with having it in one of the existing agencies was if you put it in one place, there, there was concern that if you had multiple agencies being involved in the licensing and having duties, that it kind of creates a little bit of a bureaucratic kind of octopus that might not be the most efficient, as opposed to having it all contained in one regulatory body that coordinates them and has their own rules and their own enforcement. So, thank you. That's helpful. Has anybody um, estimated the size of the bureaucracy that it's going to take to? To do this thing, because um, it seems like a whole different thing that's being set up. Well, uh, I think because you got two now. You got the you got the dispensaries that are going, and they're, they're being regulated and watched over. Now you're going to have the other, and it seems that's going to be state wide. This, this is sounds like a big operation to me, and I'm just wondering how the oversight is going to be done. Well, you know, the contemplation is you have the five-member board with two staff people at the beginning. They will be making recommendations, as as I had mentioned, for the build-out for whatever additional right. positions they may need. Um, yes, that's what I was for the, but um, but I think that that kind of remains to, to be seen, um, and it's 
doesn't depend on the number of applicants, the number of licenses, how many we, you know, how much oversight do you need. Um, you know, we have estimates on what the current illegal market is, but you know, it's always it's not, not, not like you can get an exact number on that, really. And so, you know, one of the stated goals of 54 is to try to move a, as much of the illegal market into the regulated market as possible. And so you have kind of guesses, you know, we, we had the RAND report um, that was completed for, um, to, for the state several years ago um, that estimated that there's 100,000 cannabis, regular cannabis users in, in the state. And so um, I don't know what the number is on the dispensary. My understanding is that the dispense, the register of patients on the dispensary has dropped since 511 took effect last July. So I think we were, we were pretty steadily moving up for a while, and then um, they've seen the numbers drop, but somewhere between five and 6,000. And so if you take those folks plus, you know, maybe so you subtract, so you get, you, I don't know, you have 100,000 people who are using, and most of them are using um, uh, either in, they're participating in the illegal market where they might be growing their own, or they might be sharing with their neighbors because under 511, which passed last year, um, uh, any person who's 21 years of age or older can grow cannabis for themselves and they can share up to an ounce with other people. Um, and so it could just, there's a, I'm sure, a big sharing community, but there's also a very, you know, very well established, vibrant, um, illegal. Uh, and so what they're trying to do is try to move as much of that illegal market into the into the regulated market as possible. And so the question is, is how much of that comes into the regulated market and how big is that? Okay, so um, I just want to remind us that that although this is all really interesting, <laughs> our um, our focus is supposed to be the um, what this bill will sure. do to the existing medical program that this com committee has overseen. Carl. Uh, just, you, you mentioned a figure of five or 6,000 less people are now in no, the... No, that's how many total. Registered patients. Registered patients. Oh, okay. Yep. But do, do we know how many have been lost to the system since then? Uh, yeah, I can check with, with, with okay. the DPS about that. that. Right. But I know that we were, it was steadily moving up, oh, and right. then once... We actually got yeah. that. We can find it online, because we had... Oh, really? Okay. We had Judge Wallen here a couple of weeks ago, and it, it, my recollection is that it was a dip, but, but it was a little... Yeah. Okay. It just wasn't... It did not continue going up. Right. Um, so I'm going to go through, I have, you have on your iPads just some language, the excerpted language. Um, I'm just going to focus in on. So what's, what page are we on? So if you look at the doctor. Most of us hard copies. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So, no. uh, the registry of the unofficial version of the Senate. Do you have, um, do they have the one that I sent you earlier today? It's on their iPad. Okay. okay. So I think that, because that is okay. kind of the latest, okay. uh, GovOps hasn't really done much to this, but there are a couple little tweaks. So I think if you look at that and you look at the language it says under my name, so cannabis registry sections of the bill. And I just excerpted some things from the current GovOps <coughs> amendment. And so um, when you're looking at this language, what it is is it is adopting the first section, section nine here, is adopting a new chapter for uh, a medical cannabis registry. This new statutory language would not take effect until January 1st, 2021. So it wouldn't start until the program shift over. So the, so everybody would still, continue, the patients would still continue to operate under the existing one. January 1st, 2021. How much of this is different, I mean, than what is, for example, is already asked? Uh, we just, we just started this. Okay. So I don't, I haven't done any kind of comparison. I can tell you, I can get, hit the highlights of really what it is. And this is basically kind of setting the, the very basics for a registry. So there is a lot that is not here that is currently in Chapter 86. And, uh, and then it directs the board to basically take this kind of baseline 
um, formula and then promulgate rules further. So there may be things that are currently either in statute or rule that the board may decide to add. But if you look at, um, in the definition section, um, uh, is, so you have cannabis, which is the same meaning that you have under current law. Um, I'm just using cannabis, one of the things about the shift over is the terminology. So I'll typically say cannabis, although I realize that under current law, it's generally referred to as marijuana, but they're the same thing. Um, cannabis products, um, when you refer to cannabis products, those are just meaning anything essentially that contains cannabis, so it could be anything from a consumable to, a, to an oil to a cream or something like that. Those things are currently available at dispensaries. The definition of healthcare professional is the same as in current law. Something that is not the same as it relates to a healthcare professional is that under current law, in order to be a registered patient, you have to have a bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship, which is means that you have to have had a relationship with that healthcare provider for at least a duration of three months. There are some exceptions for that, but generally there is a three month requirement for that relationship. That is not a part of the current language in, in what's being considered. Um, the definitions for our mature and immature plants are the same. Subdivision A, qualifying medical. So is B the same? It includes individuals who are professionally licensed? Yes, the definition of healthcare professional that's in here is the same exact as current so, law. So current law allows New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make sure yep. that's on. So the definition of qualifying medical condition, the term is different because it's debilitating medical condition under current law, but the definition is the same. So there's no changes there for, for essentially what would be the entry for the verification for so, the medical so condition. So what is the import, or what, what is the impact of taking out the word debilitating? If we take out the word debilitating, what does it do in terms of going forward? Um, I think it's just a policy choice of how, of how to use the term. The I mean, definition. We, I mean, we have. I mean, it's just a, we have a bill on our wall that I think. Um, that, that, I mean, that has come over from the Senate that deals specifically with um, medical marijuana and the conditions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, we're removing the term debilitating. Um, make it from a policy point of view make more sense to open it up to other kinds of things that are just a medical condition that are not debilitated. Um, I, uh, I see. I see what you're saying. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's a right. No, I think curiosity. it was just a. Um, I think it was just a preference for a, a, a language choice on, in the other body to, to not use debilitating. It would be more of a talking about what, what, what qualifies. But the definition is the same. So moving on to the next section for the registry, it simply states that the board is to establish the cannabis registry for the purpose of allowing persons with qualifying medical conditions and caregivers to obtain privileges regarding cannabis and cannabis product possession, use, cultivation, and, per and, and purchase. Um, subsection B, which is at the top of the page. So um, under this proposal, and again, remember that this is going. This is going to be going forward in a in a world in which everyone can possess a certain amount and also purchase. Um, so uh, a patient would be able to cultivate no more than two mature or seven immature plants. That's same as current law. So no change there. It would continue to be three additional immature plants than what any person could do. I thought it was four. No, it's seven. No, it's it's four for for someone who's not a patient. Okay, I thought the legislation was you could have two mature and four. That's what passed last year, but that's for like somebody like me who's not a registered patient. <coughs> okay. Patients right yeah, now can do two and seven, you, and they would continue to be doing two yeah, and seven. Okay. Yeah. I understand. So there is new language there right after that first sentence that any cannabis harvested from the plant shall not count towards the possession limit. So 
what happens. So right now, under current law for patients, patients can have two ounces of cannabis. They can also grow their two and seven plants. But the law is silent on what happens when your plants become mature and you want to harvest it. Um, and so it doesn't really talk about that. But last year in H511, it did address that issue with regard to everybody. And it said that for everybody who can have two and four, and you can have an ounce, and whatever you harvest off your own plants, as long as you keep that in a secure location where your plants are grown, that doesn't count towards your ounce. Because the idea is that like, if you're only allowed to keep an ounce and you're allowed to grow, if you harvest five ounces off your plants, are you supposed to flush the other four down the toilet, or what do you, what do, you do with it? The, you know, the, so when, you, when I talk about how much you can have as your, you know, your ounce, that's separate and apart from whatever you harvest off your plants, if you choose to grow, which you don't have to. So, um, so this just trues, this language just trues it up with what you passed last year to clarify about what happens once you harvest your plants. So it's the so, same. So what does someone do with six ounces? Sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think what a lot of people do is if they grow outside and then they have a couple plants, then they harvest that and then they store it. And that's their in my thing. Store sure, it in my mind. As long as it is stored in the indoor facility on the property with the cannabis. Well, oh, right. Yes, your barn. As long as it's in there. Yep. You're good. We're lighting so, the old <laughs> So, so, can you give me then? Um, I'm not really understood. When we say possess, that just I guess means on their person at any point in time, mm -hmm. um, because you, you possess it even if you're storing it someplace else. Yeah, yeah, so it's just an ex example. The idea is that you can have that in, in, on your person. So it could be you know in your back. Or somewhere, um, three ounces is a lot of cannabis. And you know how? You're not in your back. <laughs> it's very, it's very lightweight. I'm, I'm presuming. I mean, just three ounces seems like a lot right. to carry. Well, remember, so this is separate and apart. Not everybody. So we think about. I don't know. They may have data on this. Like, what proportion of patients actually grow their own versus go to a dispensary in order to get their their products? So. Um, so they're allowed to do either. Um, so, but for someone who perhaps isn't going to grow, and then maybe and you want to talk to the dispensary about this, and they go and they obtain their cannabis from a dispensary, my understanding from the testimony before is that there's a wide variety depending on how long somebody has been using, the, the, whatever symptoms they're using it for, things like that, about how much they need, and especially when it comes down to certain products that have. Um, distilled cannabis down to something that some be, have, you know, a, want being a higher um, conversion because of the type of product it is. But this is referring to cannabis, not cannabis products. Yes. Wow. But I would say that this is, there's a translation, um, you know, maybe who would add something, say three ounces of cannabis or cannabis products in combination, the way that they do for retail sales. I remember us having this discussion on the medical marijuana bill about how much of the differences in um, right, tinctures and the weights of different things. Um, but I'm just, I'm just reading according to definitions, and this would be the plant only. It would not be tinctures and edibles or anything else. That has a separate definition. I got, I got a good idea. We can use the plastic bags that we're trying to get rid of to store it. I thought we had a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no we can use the plastic bags we're trying to get rid of to store it. And is, is three ounces what we have in the medical marijuana bill now? It's currently two ounces. Two ounces. Oh, okay. Current law. Current law is two. And we increased that from one, yes. my recollection, to two. With some feedback, and now we can have to great. This is all for people who are sick so far. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, could a person be a, uh, a 
uh, patient of the dispensary and be a regular person at the same time. <laughs> so they could have seven, uh, let's see, seven no. floors, 11 and four. No. You can't. That's, is that there is somewhere in the law that it says, it says that? you can't? No, but the, the, the way that the registry work is, is it is, is, is an exception to the rule. The rule is I can have um, I can have an ounce and I can have two or four plants. Yeah. As a registered patient, I am exempted from that and I get a special I have the special opportunity to be able to do this. But you can still go. My two and seven plants if I'm a patient. But I don't get to add I don't get to, I don't get to be under the benefit of both. Last time we checked, we have a lot of oversight on that, too. Mm -hmm. I'm kidding with you, Ms. Wow. <laughs> um, so, so I'm thinking about what, what are the benefits as a registered patient in a commercial world is you can have three more immature plants, you can have an extra two ounces, and you would have the ability to go to a dispensary. And so that's what's in B3 there. And, and you can be um, under age, under and you can be And you can be under 21. So when I'm talking about the commercial, I'm always talking about you have to be 21 years of age or older, but you do not have to be on the registry. You can be um, under 21, you can be under 18, as long as you have your parents or guardians have um, signed off on your application for the registry. Um, so I'm going to actually, so I'm going to skip around if that's okay. I'm going to go actually to the dispensary language and, and let me, I just want to highlight because I think it'll help in talking about it, about understanding um, what patients, the benefits for a patient. Michelle, you're probably yes. going to hate me when I say this. Um, but I think what will help this committee um, is to have a side-by-side si -side of the current medical um, and, you know, half the piece of paper says current and half the piece of paper says proposed. Because then we know what are we um, looking at to um, to change. Sure. Um, so if I can direct your attention to page, I guess it looks like eight. Page of, eight of this draft. Oh, 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 Is it eight? Six. 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 Sorry. Okay. Page six and looking at the dispensary language. Okay. I just wanted to go through the, the things that you can see the things that they're allowed to do because this relates to, again, if you're a patient, what does that get you in a commercial world? Um, if someone's using the big thing that we got, it's page 43. Um, so the first is the language about that, you know, it's the intent that there continue to be a, a system of well regulated license cannabis for providing certain products and services to patients and caregivers um, that's separate and apart from the commercial system. Um, so if you look at subsection B there in section 971, so a dispensary that would be licensed here would be able to do the following things that are not, that will not, or are not in this draft contemplated to be allowed for commercial licensees. So as I already mentioned, they should continue to be vertically integrated under one license. Um, they would also, uh, the products, the cannabis and the cannabis products that they would sell would not be taxed um, so that, to the patients. They uh, would be able to deliver cannabis and cannabis products to patients and caregivers. So under this current draft, um, delivery is not available under the commercial system, but it would continue to be available through dispensaries. Um, uh, also would allow patients and caregivers to um, in addition to delivery, to be able to purchase without leaving their vehicles. 
Um, so there's a one facility that allows the drive through. Um, they'd be able to produce and sell products that have a higher THC content than is permitted for a cannabis establishment. So in S54, there's restrictions around um, you can only, if you're doing a, pro a certain product, you can only have, you can have a, a maximum of 100 milligrams of THC per product. It has to be, can be no more than 10 milligrams per serving. And then there are other provisions in there that allow the board to be regulating the types of products that are offered and putting kind of criteria on there about what's sold. And so it may be that the dispensary um, by rule is allowed to offer different types of products with different concentrations that would be available in the commercial market. Um, so that's four and five. Um, and then also similarly, they might be able to produce and sell products that are not otherwise permitted um, in the commercial market, but might be appropriate um, for the medical. And then they're allowed to sell larger quantities um, uh, to patients and caregivers because under the commercial system, it would be limited to an ounce. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. So in, in one, I mean, in uh, two, three, and four, um, it specifically refers to patients and caregivers. Mm -hmm. So these exceptions for patients and caregivers. Yep. And then five, six, and seven don't refer to patients and caregivers. Um, is it intent? Because these licensees theoretically will also have a commercial license. Um, no, it's I, just a language thing. I didn't, um, it's in, uh, Dispensaries under the under the intro language and the way that they're able to do are only allowed to be selling products for patients and caregivers. Okay. If you look at um, section 973, it talks about specifically. So if you look at 973A3. So I just wanted, because I wanted to tie in kind of the dispensary piece when we were still talking about the patients. Um, so those are the things that have paid that being on the registry, the advantages to be on the registry. Subsection C back on page three um, is just with regard to privacy and exemptions from public records that's similar to what is contained now through the medical registry. Top of page four, subsection D, directing the board to establish an application process through rulemaking. So uh, currently in statute, there's all the stuff about the forms and what the forms shall look like and how they shall be and everything is all prescribed in the statute. That's not done here. It's more left to the board to be developing the application process and the forms. So section 953 are patients. So, uh, so the rules adopted by the board, a person can register to obtain the benefits of the registry. Um, uh, in addition to an application form to be completed by a person who seeks to register as a patient, the board shall develop a medical verification form to be completed by the applicant's health care provider and submitted by the applicant that attests to the person having a qualifying medical condition. But again, it doesn't put all of that stuff out in the statute, it, rather than just picking up that existing and allows can look at the existing modifications they want to knock it through the wall. There's a provision in subsection B of 953 that, as already mentioned, if you're under 18, you have to have your application signed by a parent or guardian. Section 954 allows for uh, someone to serve as a person's caregiver, uh, so they can apply to be a caregiver on their budget. <coughs> So um, all of these things are pursuant to rules adopted by the board. Um, and I guess the question is, in the current law, my recollection is at least that we have some sort of guidelines about who can do what and, and, or not. Um, and, and I guess I'm just making that as a notation. We're, we're a little more specific about Right, and I think, I, mean, I think what will be really um, helpful, Michelle, um, and I'm going to have to stop us because at three we're moving on to pre-K. Um, is if, if 
especially as it relates to the existing medical marijuana law and statute, if we really have this side by side so that we can see it. I know you're doing it as you go through. Um, knowing this committee, we like we, we need it visual, and then we can go back and. Um, we may go, oh, this doesn't make sense, but when we see it all, we'll go, okay, yes, it does make sense to, to do that. So that would probably be a good place to start. Um, and I regret that we need to stop because hopefully they're in the hall. We, have, we, we expect two secretaries. We, we, we expect two secretaries. Oh, actually, the secretary and a commissioner. Because, um, um, because, um, uh, Secretary Gobey turns out has an appointment. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle. Thank you. Our goal, Michelle, is to have every single member of uh, the council in here for long periods of time. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> so, oh, yes. That's why I asked her. I'm having some some ads about this too. I will be I mean that
Um, so again, just a little background. Um, as you all know, you're probably very familiar with Act 166, um, but it was passed in 2014, um, fully implemented in 2016-17. Um, you know, it has wide reach, so that's, you know, I think really exciting that the legislator, legislature has taken this on um, and is really being careful about looking at it and, and studying it. Um, you can see uh, approximately 75% of four-year-olds and 60% of three-year-olds are actually affected by this, um, or they're they're participating in it, I should say. Um, so really, Act 11 um, really wants to understand how to more effectively and efficiently provide state-funded universal pre-K in Vermont. Our timeline is um, we started this work back in October. Uh, our interim report was submitted in March, and our final report will be submitted in July. So it's really a quick turnaround for us um, in the research world, um, but it's been uh, fast and furious and fun, so um, it's been great. Um, so the key areas of interest for this study, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. There is a little bit more detail in each of the um, in uh, the act, but um, really, how well is the fun funding model working? Um, how are families making choices about pre-K? Um, does the system provide equitable access, and especially for kids who maybe come from more disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly rural or low income? Does the current system create undesired outcomes? Um, and how can oversight be simplified? So just a, uh, by way of a status update, so we have conducted, analyzed, and summarized the findings from 13 semi-structured interviews. Um, so these were with uh, legislators, the Agency of Education, representatives from uh, Human Services, Agency of Human Services, um, the Vermont School Boards Association, as well as the Superintendents Association, Building Bright Futures, and um, a professional at the University of Vermont who's very familiar with pre-K in Vermont. Um, and then Aaron uh, also conducted a systematic review of the research liter literature across uh, multiple different topics related to what um, Act 11 is trying to decipher. And so as you saw in the interim report, that's really focused around kind of summarizing and merging together the two sets of data, which were, would be from those state level interviews um, and, the, and the review. Um, so in terms of next steps, uh, we are in the process of interviewing um, pre-K providers. So we've taken a random sample of 30 providers across all of the regions of the state. This includes um, private, public, and private center-based public and family child care providers so that we ensure that we have a range of opinions, um, also a random selection so that we know we're getting all the different kinds of voices that might be coming to the table around this issue. Um, we I'm also correct, the Head Start is another Head Start one. is actually another one. We ensured are they included in your Yes, we ensured that they were part of that um, sample. Yep, absolutely that's a great question. Um, and we also are um, going to be conducting a survey of families regarding their pre-K program choice. So this will get at how are they making choices, what are some things that may have um, adversely impacted them, um, and so forth. And then we're also going to be conducting an analysis of data that will be provided by the Agency of Education. Um, so for example, one of the things that we'll be doing is looking at kindergarten students and comparing um, the demographic characteristics, so um, you know, race, ethnicity, uh, um, special education status, free reduced price lunch status, between those who accessed pre-K and those who did not access pre-K. So it's a kind of a retrospective looking back. Um, and then, of course, we'll draft the final report and submit by July 1st. So that will wrap everything up. That's where we'll kind of make our final recommendations um, based on the, all of the information that we've collected together. Um, so I can pause there for questions before I pass it over. Can you tell me what a semi-structured interview yes, is? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so we have a structured set of um, questions that we start with so that we ensure that we're asking really about the same things of all of our interviewees. But our interviewees might mention something that kind of makes us say, hmm, maybe we should ask this question. So we allow ourselves to kind of go off of what um, the questions, pre-specified questions are, if there is an area that we think we should explore further. So you have, you have canned questions. Correct. And then the semi 
yep. structure. There's other questions that might develop from that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Great question. So, how did you figure out? Who did you ask? Who did you inquire? Who did you consult with to um, identify your semi-structured questions? Oh, that's a really questions. great question. Absolutely. So for everything that we've been doing with this, we've been working in close collaboration with um, the Agency of Education, so in particular, Kate Rogers and Laura Greenwood, um, in addition to folks at the Child Development Division, so Reva Murphy and Melissa Regal Garrett. So when we have um, done any of the um, surveys that we've created or the interview protocol, and even the report that you see, we've sat down with them, shared that information with them, and had a conversation about um, what they're seeing, what they think is missing, um, anything that jumps out to them is important. So yeah. with both AOE and AHS? Yep. And you must have been involved with the community action agencies as well, if you were dealing with that staff. But we're dealing with Head Start. So we have not, um, we have not communicated directly with Head Start. Um, so for example, Renee Kelly has not been part of, Renee Swain, excuse me, um, the conversations in terms of the specific, say, instruments or interview protocols. Um, but insofar as CDD oversees all of the providers, um, the Head Start um, lens has been brought to bear. Um, how did you um, determine the families um, to interview? That's a really great question. So families are always difficult to get to. Um, so what our approach is to, we have the 30 randomly selected providers that have participated in the interviews, um, and we are asking them to help us recruit the families that are their families. Um, we're providing them with um, online links that the families can access to complete the surveys anonymously, as well as paper and pencil versions of those surveys with a postmarked, um, a, a stamped envelope so families can feel comfortable answering honestly um, and not feel like their provider is going to be receiving those um, responses. And so um, then you will have a sample from all the different types of um, pre K. Correct. That's the that's the assumption. Can go on. Okay. <laughs> I, I say with surprise. Okay. I'm gonna uh, pass this over to Erin now. She's going to talk um, about some of the key findings from the report. Yeah, so as Claire mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about the different sections of the report and go into our key findings both from our interviews with stakeholders and then from the research literature as well. And so we'll start with delivery models and specifically we looked at Vermont's mixed delivery model for pre-K in which public, private, home-based providers and Head Start providers are all able to uh, become pre-qualified and participate. And when we spoke with interviewees, they generally expressed support for the mixed delivery model. And one of the main positive aspects they pointed out is that mixed delivery, delivery allows for a wide degree of caregiver choice. And so parents and families can choose from a program that works well for them in terms of the location, the educational philosophy of the program, the hours of operation. Uh, let's them pick something that works well for them. We also heard from a more practical standpoint that Vermont might not be able to offer a truly universal pre-K program without mixed delivery. And some stakeholders thought that if pre-K was limited to public programs only or private programs only, that there just might not be enough um, seats and enough capacity for all of the three and four year olds who want to enroll. And then we also heard some concerns from the stakeholders we spoke with. One was about the cross-sector applicability of regulations that were originally designed for private settings or home-based settings, and that public schools had faced some challenges or found it to be somewhat duplicative of their own regulations and safety standards that they are already complying with. 
And one other concern that came up um, was that some stakeholders noted that there have been some pockets of misperception and mistrust between public and private providers, um, which possibly has been exacerbated now that both providers are working more closely together to deliver the same types of services. So <clears throat> you, you've heard, you heard from some <clears throat> public school, public providers who thought some of the regulations were duplicative or whatever. Did you hear from any private providers who feel like the regulations are duplicative or um, don't fit there? I mean, you get their model. I, I should have uh, set the stage a little bit better. So the interim report uh, is focused on those state level interviews. So we okay. have not so I, I may have confused this situation by talking about what we're doing next first, but all of the key findings we're talking about now for any of the um, in, enter, interviewees were all at that state level. So there were no providers that were part of that conversation as of yet. We, will, we are asking them about those things though. And so when we looked at the literature on mixed delivery, we found that experts um, have expressed support as well for mixed delivery systems, and they pointed out, similar to Vermont stakeholders, that mixed delivery allows for uh, wide flexibility and parent choice. They also noted that mixed delivery can help to promote broader involvement in quality rating and improvement systems, so providers are more likely to opt into um, the STARS program, for example, or to try to increase their rating within the STARS system. And that mixed delivery can also help to reduce child transitions. So uh, families can choose from a program that operates for 40, 50 hours a week or a full year schedule. Um, and so that reduces the number of times children within a day or a week have to go between multiple types of programs. One concern that came up within the literature, though, um, is related to possible inequities between public and private <laughs> providers based on uh, the salary and benefits available for teachers, and that generally public schools are able to offer pre-K teachers higher salaries, um, more expansive benefits, and that this could, in theory, lead to a situation where the best pre-K teachers um, end up in the public schools because of, of those options. Um, I'm just, it, you talked about that um, the support for the mixed delivery system and parent choice, and I'm just wondering if in your literature review there was anything noting, uh, anything worthy of note with regard to actually having the opposite impact uh, a mixed delivery system might have? In other words, <laughs> that um, before when three and four year olds weren't really eligible, except for under you know limited circumstances for public um, pre-K kind of situation, and now they are eligible for public pre-K, any um, potential reduction in choice because of the private pre-Ks not being able to, having fewer consumers in essence, having fewer families and fewer participants in the private pre-K. Um, we seem to have noted some essentially going out of business of the, of the private pre-K because of that. Sure, I haven't come across any of that in the research literature, but that is one thing that, um, you know, as we're talking to providers right now, they may bring up with us if it is a concern for them. Um, but within the literature, that was not something that we really wanted to Thank you. I'm going to ask a basic question. <coughs> What's the research liter literature? You talked about experts and you talked about research literature. So what, I mean, is that education? I mean, what, 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 what is that? I think it's so interesting that you bring that up because um, I was recently in a situation where we were taught, being taught what jargon not to use, and literature was one of those things that we were taught not to use. And we're using it anyway, so there you have it. Um, so we, it's really the research base, so 
with the studies that we've looked at that we've summarized. So when we can talk about the research literature, it's kind of like what's out there around a particular topic. Um, that is. How do we know that what's out there isn't just me writing about something? So that's really good. So do you want to speak to the criteria used for the uh, what you reviewed? Yeah, so um, a lot of the research literature that we looked at is, is peer reviewed. So it essentially had to go through a process where it was vetted and feedback was provided by um, the colleagues of professional researchers who are investigating these various topics. Um, so that was one criteria we looked for, was just simply what was within the peer reviewed literature. And then we also spent time looking for uh, other evaluations of state pre-K programs, so within other states that have early childhood education that's publicly funded, or pre-K programs that are publicly funded, um, looking at those types of reports as well. And then as far as the specific criteria that we used, we really tried to build in our criteria for search <coughs> terms around the issues of interest to Vermont. And so thinking about those core questions that we're looking to address, and uh, we based our search around those particular terms and issues. And then once we actually got into reading some of these studies, um, not as a hard and fast rule, but oftentimes we tried to select the ones where um, there was a, a strong research design, so something like um, where they basically have a control group, where they're looking for children who participated in pre-K against children who didn't participate in pre-K and what those outcomes were. So really thinking as well about the quality and rigor of the research design or the data set that researchers were looking at. So uh, you're making it sound like it's a control group, but I mean, my friend who who dropped out of pre-K was just not ready for school. So if we're comparing her to her sister who succeeded, we're, we're not really comparing comparable kids. And to that point, that's why in all of the work that we've been doing around universal pre-K in Vermont, um, we've steered clear of kind of talking about it as um, a control or really making those comparisons. From my perspective, until we have the data that will allow us to understand what are some other early childhood um, opportunities that, uh, that children are participating in. So you may have children who are getting 40 hours a week of high quality care, but you only know about their 10 hours a week of pre-K because they're private pay and no data system is going to pick them up. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of things that happen with kids in early childhood that make it impossible for us to say, you know, treatment and control. Um, what Aaron's referring to is um, looking at studies that were either um, kind of experimental, it sounds like a terrible term, I know, it's really, that's jargony, um, in where they did have a control group or a, and a treatment group, or those that would be considered what we would call quasi-experimental, where they really have a strong research design. It's, it's, not, an, it's not an experiment, um, but you're able to control within reason for other um, competing explanations of why you might see differences in children's outcomes. Um, so she's really speaking to the research that was reviewed, not so much what we're doing. Um, and I wouldn't say that even the work that we're doing as part of this evaluation is, um, is going to be quasi-experimental or any of that. We're really helping um, kind of show the landscape of what's happening and make inferences as best we can based on, um, based on a bunch of different um, approaches to looking at the information and the data. But you're very, you're very correct. When we talk about the funding models in the second bullet, K through 12 funding formulas are best option. Is that from the research or is that from the Vermont people that you get? <laughs> Sure, so um, the second two bullet points there are from the research literature. Um, and so thinking about those K through 12 funding formulas, so um, there are um, experts in the K through 12 funding or pre-K funding who have looked at the different types of systems that states use. So a lot of them might use a K through 12 funding formula. 
some use lottery proceeds, um, for example, and some states rely on a, an allocation from their legislature each year. And they've typically found that by using the K through 12 funding formula and just adopting pre-K to make it a pre-K through 12 formula, that these states typically have the most consistent and stable levels of funding from year to year, and generally the highest amounts of funding overall for pre-K. And so are they, is it fair to say that they are all public pre-K? Um, they're all publicly funded pre-K, but they're, they may be within a mixed delivery system very similar to Vermont. Um, so other aspects of funding, when we talked with our interviewees, there were some um, concerns that were brought up. One was about um, that there are some stakeholders within Vermont who prefer that public funds be used for public programs only and maintain a general opposition to the use of public funding to go to support private programs. So that was one concern we heard. Um, another issue that was brought up related to possible inequities in the amount of funding between public and private providers. And this was based on the fact that public schools typically are funded for pre-K students through that funding formula I just mentioned. And private providers are funded through a predetermined tuition amount. And that those numbers um, typically are not the same, with public schools typically having higher amounts of funding per student. And so there were some concerns that that might lead to inequitable funding levels between the different settings. And then um, one other thing I wanted to mention, just going back to the research literature on K-12 funding, which is also relevant to that point about different funding levels by setting, is that some states that have a model similar to Vermont where they're using a K-12 funding formula to fund pre-K and they have a mixed delivery system, that some of these states have established guidelines where for the um, amount of funding that goes to a public school through that funding formula, if that public school then chooses to subcontract with a private provider, that they are required to give a set percentage of the money they received through the funding formula to that private provider. And that's a regulation some states have put in place to help ensure that there's equity um, in the overall funding levels. In addition to K-12 funding formulas, one other option for funding pre-K that we mentioned in the report is pay for success or social impact bonds. Um, and this is something you may have heard of or be very familiar with. But essentially, these are a relatively new model of funding early childhood education or other government preventative services in which an external investor puts up the initial funding for the program. So they kind of take on the risk of whether that program will be successful or not. And then they are only repaid by the government if certain targets or outcomes are met. And so for pre-K, this might be something like um, an assessment score that students are measured on or a reduction in special education placement are some examples we've come across. And so if the programs meet those targets, the government then agrees to pay the investor who initially funded the program. And so this has been used in um, Chicago and in the state of Utah to fund expansion of pre-K services. It is a, a newer model. And so it's hard to say how it really compares to the K-12 funding formula, but it could be something to keep an eye on in the future. Um, if there are other examples of states or programs that opt to, to use this route and to see how those turn out. Um, I, I've investigated deeply pay for success models for other issues, incarceration, things like that. Um, I've always been told that we don't have the um, the density, the enough people, like in order to to really um, implement a pay for success model, you know, like a Chicago. Sure. Or, right. I'm just curious, you know, if you found other um, communities that would model more our size and our density. That um, you know, I, I I think it's a great idea, public private partnership. 
but um, I've always been told that we can't really take advantage of it because of our size, because we don't have enough pop, enough of a population. So it's just yeah. kind of I heard that. I don't know if it's perhaps because the investor is looking for a greater return, mm -hmm. frankly, than what could be achieved. Sure. Um, I know that with the programs in Chicago and Utah, Goldman Sachs has been the funder. Right. I do believe, and I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe there are some smaller organizations, like I'm familiar with one in Boston, who are doing similar work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they might willing to take on for yeah. a, a smaller return than some place like Goldman sure. Sachs, perhaps, but um, that might be something to explore. Go ahead, Okay. How do, under some of these models, how would they uh, open up the uh, recruitment for some of these students? It would seem that they would tend to, people would try to limit the intake of their students to guarantee the outcomes. So I, it would seem hard for me to understand how you would sure. equitably do that. So uh, part of a successful pay for success model is there, you pretty much have to have a external rigorous evaluation um, of the outcomes. So having a, a research team and a plan in place for the evaluation and agreed measures in advance of what you'll look at as a successful outcome. Um, and so having that external research or evaluation team is really your safeguard um, against a program claiming success when it maybe hasn't actually achieved that. Uh, so one thing I'll say, I think that gets maybe at your question too, is in a state level program like, like Vermont's, your kind of intervention um, or what is actually happening in the classroom is not necessarily the same. Um, and so you may have less of an ability to affect that outcome than you might in even a city with more kids. You might have more control over what's happening um, at that level because it's more local control. Um, so that just might be another, we actually didn't talk about that previously, but your question makes me think of that is that that might be another concern thinking about a pay for success model within um, a system like Vermont um, where you have a lot of local control, you have um, a mixed delivery system and so forth and different approaches to the work. I mean, I like the overall concept, but yeah. I can see how it could be skewed and right. we'd have to work, people would have to work on setting up some controls to yeah. not allow them mm -hmm. Absolutely, yep. So another area we looked at was access and dosage in terms of who is eligible to participate in pre-K. And um, with dosage, we're, we're really referring to how much pre-K students participate in per week or how many years they might participate before going home to, to kindergarten. And when we talked with stakeholders, they were generally mixed. And so we had an almost even split of the folks we talked to um, as to whether they prefer universal or targeted programs. And so some people told us they really preferred to have a universal system in which everyone is able to participate and there aren't any criteria. And then other people we talked to said that they wanted to make sure Vermont was really prioritizing participation and or the amount of hours per week for under-resourced children. Many of the interviewees we spoke with also suggested that 10 hours of pre-K per week might not be sufficient. Um, and they went on to recommend that the state consider offering a greater number of weekly hours. And then when we looked at the literature on universal versus targeted pre-K, one of the questions that often comes up when states are deciding between the universal versus targeted program is really, do students across the income spectrum, do they all benefit from pre-K, or is it only certain subgroups of students? And the research generally shows that students from all income levels, so low, medium, high income, do tend to see benefits from participating in pre-K, but that those benefits tend to be greater for students who are in the low and middle income segments. So there are benefits across the income spectrum, but they tend to be higher for low and middle income students. 
we also looked at was there um, was there any distinction in the age group? Um, so was there any distinction in your research or in your discussions with people around um, three year olds versus four year olds in terms of access to preschool? Um, regarding universal versus targeted, not as much, but maybe this other point will, will answer your question. Um, so we did find that there are benefits for students. The research tends to show there are benefits for students if they attend two years of pre-K, so at age three okay. and age four typically before going up to kindergarten. Those kids tend to have greater outcomes in the short term than students who attend only at, at age four. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, sort of. Close enough. You're thinking kind of right an now. interaction between income and age. So income for lower income kids, it, do they have an added benefit of um, attending earlier? Is that what you're thinking? And yes. And, and is there any is there any difference in outcomes for um, <coughs> age and type of pre-K that they? Um, participate in, so whether it's you know, private center-based, a private home-based, or a public pre-K, is there a difference in between, across the ages and, mm -hmm. and their access to the various different types of pre-Ks? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it's fine. I think You're that's a great, I mean, it's a great question, and I think it relates to kind of, so we can, she just dropped this down, yeah. so this is definitely something that we can take a closer look at. It relates I think also to how we maybe think parents make choices about pre-K um, and you know maybe they're choosing more of the family providers or the private providers for their younger children um, and um, perhaps making different choices at older ages we're obviously going to be getting at some of that but we, we wrote it down and we'll take a look because I don't want to answer right, right <laughs> without having the right answer. No I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. that. Sandy, um, I'm troubled by the use of the term short-term gains what does that mean and what do we lose when that's over? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great question. Um, so in the research, um, a lot of the research has looked at the outcomes for students at kindergarten entry or at the end of the pre-K year. And um, a larger question is do those gains persist for students who attend pre-K um, as they continue through their education? Um, or is there the possibility that students who maybe don't go to pre-K or early childhood education and start at kindergarten, do they catch up to their peers who attended pre-K, essentially? So with this particular um, bullet point you'll see here about short-term benefits for students who attend for two years, that's based on the fact that the research has really looked at short-term outcomes primarily. Obviously, it's much more challenging to study students into high school or adulthood. Um, and there's just not as much literature on the long-term outcomes and the relationship between attending for one or two years. So is this, is this research done on um, 10 hours a week of pre-K, or is this research done on five days a week, That's four right. hours a day? So for this, we we focused, um, Aaron focused on kind of the more comparable programs. Um, so I mean, you've probably heard of the Head Start Impact Study, perhaps. Um, so kind of to speak to you know where that study is was a randomized control trial where they actually did randomly assign kids to attend Head Start and to not attend Head Start. Um, you know. It showed great gains at kindergarten, and then by third grade, those uh, the kids look the same. And um, kids are in Head Start for the, more than ten hours. Well, exactly. Well, so this is this is different, very much so, and it's and they have a lot more regulation over exactly what it looks like. Um, but there's also the Tennessee Pre-K, um, and that also probably was more. And Aaron can speak to the number of hours. Um, but in terms of the catch up and the um, or the loss of gains or the catching up of kids who are not in who are not in pre K, um, there is some evidence that um, quality might make a difference as well. So there are other researchers that weren't the primary researchers on the Head Start Impact study who examined it a little bit closer and did find that there was variation in the third grade reading scores depending on the quality rating of the um, early childhood um, center, the Head Start Center that they were in. Um, 
yes, Head Start is different than um, 10 hours of publicly funded pre-K. Um, but there have been other studies that have been done for the Tennessee pre-K study that also did find that um, it, it's the kind of the big conundrum right now in early childhood is really understanding how can we show sustained gains. Um, not that we don't want other kids to catch up, we want them to all do well, um, but how do we show those sustained gains um, from pre-K? And are we measuring the right things, really, to be honest with you? I'm, I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm having a tough time trying to understand bullet two, three, no, two, four, and five. And one, it says the interviewees talk about increasing the pre-K hours. The other one says it's un there's an unclear relationship between weekly hours of pre-K and child outcomes. And then the last one says that there was a short-term gain in kids that spent more hours, more time. So I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. how do they relate to each other? Sure, so Once. yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, and so one of our goals here is to, to talk about and present both what we heard from the state level stakeholders who we interviewed, and then also to show what the, the research and the data on similar topics might say. And so in some cases, frankly, those, um, the, the findings from those two different ways we went about collecting information may conflict somewhat. And so you may have a situation where stakeholders say, well, we really think that um, a certain thing should be happening within the program. And then the research literature might say something slightly different or might not support that. Um, exactly the same way that the stakeholders pointed out to us. So we think it's important to take into consideration both what we're hearing from um, those within the state and then also what some of the, the broader research says as well. And then these are kind of two, two different issues. So one is, um, again, that question of how many hours students receive per week. But then the other, so the years of pre-K, um, we might think of that from more of a developmental perspective for young children is at what age is it most appropriate or beneficial for them to be getting this early childhood education in a structured PK program. And so the question there is really, do those benefits come in starting at age three typically, or do they come in starting at age four? So the, so the distinction is so, uh, so bullet two comes from the interviewees. Um, so that's that data source. So they, they just had a general feeling that more pre-K hours were needed based on their experience and expertise versus four and five come from the research that we reviewed. Um, so, you know, it may be that, um, so the unclear relationship, and I think that there is a distinction there to make that, um, that it wasn't 10 hours versus more. It was what was in the research, which you had said the part-time versus full-time. Um, so that part-time might be defined here. It's actually defined differently everywhere, which is one of the really difficult things about doing early childhood research and trying to understand it. But that part-time um, was generally defined as 15 to 20 hours. Um, and full-time is really more of the 30 to 40 hour range. Um, so it's again not apples to apples when comparing to Vermont's situation. Um, but there's this idea here where the number of hours that you get in a week might impact your outcomes. Uh, but there's also the idea that separately, the total number of years that you attend pre-K might impact your outcomes. And so that's what those two bullets, that's, that's what kind of differentiates those two bullets there. Uh, I, I'm having trouble picturing a statewide um, uh, interviewee stakeholder. You, you, said, you said they were state-level stakeholders, yeah. and, and now I'm... So are we talking about RIVA we are talking about? We're, so, so we are talking about um, folks like RIVA, folks like Dan, folks like um, some of our uh, colleagues around the table, uh, the legislature. Uh, we had a professor at the University of Vermont, um, Building Great Futures, the interim executive director, um, the executive director of the Superintendents Association, as well as the School Boards Association. 
Um, so really kind of high up, but people who represent um, in some situations really do are, are kind of representatives of um, their constituents. I mean, have they, have they visited programs? Have they, I mean, have they been in the room with teachers and children? Or? I don't know. Uh, I mean, to speak to that, that's why we're doing 30. So we did 13 of these. We wanted to get kind of the general overview. One of the reasons for doing these interviews, in addition to kind of creating these interim findings, was really to kind of get a sense of what should we be asking providers um, so that we kind of came armed with, OK, here's what the general sense is. Let's ask providers about these different topic areas and let them talk to us about what what is really happening for them. Yeah. Hopefully, can we let you at some point? And we'd like to ask lots of questions. Really? Um, get to what are your mm -hmm. interim findings? Right. Um, so where were we? In our quality. <laughs> quality. So we have a. Um, so I just want to speak to that. So these are interim findings. So one of um, one of the things that we want to ensure is that folks understand that this is kind of what we found so far along the way. But we really feel like it's important to consider these in addition to the other interview results from the other interviews as well as the family surveys as well as the data analysis from um, the, the data that we'll get from the agency of education exactly um, for that concern of um, well what what do this you know this they're coming from a particular perspective and these questions um, that we really want to know about really relate to what's the reality on the ground and so to make choices or to have key findings that are what kind of recommendations for how to move forward without having that information um, would be a little bit premature. So quality comes under equitable access or desired outcomes. I'm looking at your key areas of interest mm -hmm. and how can oversight. I'm trying to figure out where these things fit into what in fact the legislature asked you to be looking for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I will say that so these topic areas relate to also how the um, RFP was structured that we responded to. Um, so again, um, there are actually areas here, and I'm going to have to go back because I'm sorry to make all of you dizzy. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that absolutely it relates to equitable access. I think it also could relate to how families make choices around pre-K. Um, so there are different pieces um, that are important and they're kind of topic areas within pre-K that um, were important to explore in terms of a literature review. Um, I think that um, you know, we wouldn't really be able to do some of these things around these kind of broad, overarching questions like, does the system provide equitable access? I think it would be very difficult to kind of focus a review of the literature on something so broad. Um, you probably wouldn't be happy with the, you know, 200 page report that we provide to you. So, um, so, so, you, so you responded to an RFP. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Commissioner. Yes. Um, what input did AHS have in the RFP? I think that, uh, for the record, Ken Jeps, Commissioner of the Department of Children and Families, I think Reva and Melissa may have some impact uh, of a limited nature. But honestly, I think the legislature, by, limit, by describing the scope of the project, primarily did detail the, the major parameters of the RFP. Jump. I know that. Oh, sorry. Quality. Great. So we also looked at quality. So uh, the question of what makes for high quality pre-K program. And one aspect in Vermont are the teacher quality standards and uh, minimum requirements for teachers. And we found that stakeholders were concerned about the variation in teacher standards across different settings. And so some of them were worried that these different standards could lead to inequitable student experiences depending on the type of setting that they attend. And then other comments that 
we heard related to quality, one regarded the STARS system and a suggestion to simplify the STARS rating requirements. And then another was related to um, offering more professional development supports and making professional development more accessible, particularly for private providers who might not have the embedded brain professional development opportunities that their public school peers do. And then when we looked at the literature on quality, we found that what is most important for providing a high quality pre-K program is what's referred to as process quality. And so this process quality includes really the nature of the interactions between children and their pre-K teachers, or even between children and other children in the program. So in particular, thinking about high quality instructional support, such as providing regular feedback for pre-K students, and for providing them with scaffolded learning opportunities. We did find somewhat surprisingly in the research that it is found uh, based on uh, analyses of data, typically no relationship or limited relationship between early childhood educators level or type of degree and um, the outcomes for, for children. This will be. How's that go? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, this will be. I mean, go? this is one of the potentially core debates in this state right now. Right now. Um, in terms of um, while in schools we're moving towards proficiency based um, class, whatever, proficiency based as opposed to things. Um, grading A, B, and C, and structured kinds of things. It looks like what the interviewees want is simplificate, you know, um, concern over teacher qualifications. But then you see that you say the research says there's limited relationship. And if we are teaching our students in high school using a more proficiency-based process. Um, what the, uh, you know, so, I mean, it seems like there, there's a disconnect. So perhaps we can clarify a little bit here, too. So um, I think what the research is showing us that kind of more of these proficiency-based um, quality indicators of a professional um, do matter. So that's that process quality of those instructional supports that are being provided, the way that the teachers interact with the students and the children in the classroom. Uh, but what the research is not really showing is that there's a strong relationship or any relationship between teacher licensure um, and student outcomes. But that's not what this says. That's it's a yeah. level of education and child outcomes. Right, right. So that, we, that doesn't say licensure. Right, so we, we clarify on that one. And I think part of it has to do, um, so in terms of some research I do believe has shown, and I believe it's part of it, that perhaps a child development associate might have some relationship, but that's, um, so So we can, we should clarify here, and, and I think it is, um, the literature is obviously overviewed in the, um, in the report, but um, that it's not necessarily that no, ed like education itself has no relationship, but that there may be particular licensures or certifications that may or may not be related to child outcomes. But that the stronger relationship is really between these process quality aspects um, and student outcomes. So when you take it to the next, this, when you're actually evaluating our system, mm -hmm. how will you, so you'll, with these 60, 60 sets, is that what you're doing, or 30 sets? How many sets are you? How are you going to find out to edu you know, connect educators level and, and the quality and the outcomes of kids? So we're, we're not looking at child outcomes. Oh, okay. um, uh, part of that is, is it, it, I, shouldn't, I should back up a little bit. I shouldn't say that we're not looking at their outcomes at all. We are looking at associations with um, TS Gold scores. Um, but in terms of linking educator qualifications specifically to, do you want to jump in? Well, no, I just, I'm looking at your key areas of interest 
does the current system create undesired outcomes? Well, how do we know what an undesired outcome is if you're not looking at discrete data that's happening in Vermont? The next, the next phase of this. Right. So I think there might. So I guess it depends on how we're defining outcomes. Um, so if we're defining outcomes strictly as student ac uh, academic outcomes. Um, that's one thing, but one the way that we were interpreting um, what the law said and what we were asked to do is looking when we're thinking about looking at undesired outcomes, really looking at are there undesired things that are happening. So are families making choices about pre-K that they wouldn't otherwise be making because they're constrained by the limits of um, I guess the program. So how do we find that out? And is so our family survey that we're um, created that we're going to be implementing starting next week, and then also through our providers provider interviews. And, and will you be connecting? I believe that the child development division just did a whole survey. BBF just did a survey on um, on uh, families family choice. Mm -hmm. um, our survey will be much more in depth, and we've been consulting with. Um, actually, we sat with Reva and Melissa, and she reviewed, they reviewed the survey that we created. Um, we also have received copies of and attended the webinar that was just put on by um, NORC and ORC, who were the contractors who did conduct that survey. So there is um, some overlap, but actually, quite honestly, not much, because um, that's a much higher level than what we're hoping to get out of this survey. We're asking much more specific questions. No, so I, I think you now. covered it. I think that's, we definitely are working together to make sure it's limited duplication. Obviously, we wanted to provide the work that had been done by NORC um, to EDC, and I think that's hopefully helpful as they dive deeper into some of the questions that need to be posed here. Mm -hmm. So obviously, that is important. Um, I will add that from my perspective, and I'm more of a lay person, but I do think I will mention the issue about outcomes. You know, uh, Act 166 is still relatively new. Mm -hmm. And so the question about whether or not third graders, sixth graders are actually doing better is something that is really important to me. And I think we should think about how we're going to actually measure that. But frankly, it's too early to tell. Yeah, so I will say one of the things, um, I think it speaks to Sandy, is that um, earlier, you had had some concern over your, you know, you're thinking about this as a control and this as a treatment. Um, you know, there's only so much that we can control for. And one of the really big things, um, as I mentioned earlier, that we don't have, so we will look at outcomes, but um, there are differences in the number of hours that kids are receiving, depending on which program type that they're attending, most likely. Um, and we don't know anything about that. Um, and so when we have proposed the types of analyses that we'll do, we've been very cautious because we don't want to present findings to anyone to suggest that one one thing is better than another when that data may, you know, we're missing so much of what could be an alternate explanation, for example. So um, I, I don't say that we're not, I, I mean, I would love to do a study that looks at outcomes, um, kindergarten, first, second, third grade. Um, until the data systems are there, I think we need to be really creative with how we define outcomes, how we look at outcomes, um, and um, how we interpret what we're finding, because um, the data just really don't support um, a clean um, association between pre-K and um, outcomes. When you look at um, family choice, will you be able to look at, uh, to factor in socioeconomic status? We, we do ask a question on the survey about that. Um, in, you know, we are really hoping that families feel comfortable answering that question. Um, it is an anonymous survey. One of the difficulties with um, getting at families is that we don't have, and, and the Agency of Education doesn't have, um, nor does CDD, uh, you know, family addresses or ways for us to, to contact families directly. So we really don't have a way of um, doing it other, any other way than asking them outright what's their income level. One of the comments that is sometimes made about the publicly funded pre-K as contrasted to um, the private, I mean, is 
that those who can most readily take advantage of the publicly funded pre-K, which in Vermont is 10 hours a week, are those where both parents don't work or where their socioeconomic status is such that they can figure out how to get the kid somewhere else in hour 11. And, and so I don't know if that's true, but that is one of the comments that goes out there. And so if we're talking about equitable access, um, love to, to see whether is, is that rumor, you know, is that an urban myth, or is that in fact um, steeped in any kind of reality? Right. And I think one, you know, we'll be able to get um, at that a little bit with, um, with the family survey and then also with the data analysis that we'll do with the Agency of Education data, we are able to look at free and reduced price lunch status um, and see where they are enrolling. And we've already, through um, another contract we have with the U.S. Department of Ed, where we're in, working in partnership with CDD and AOE around um, issues around pre-K, we've already, on the 2016-17 school year data, done an analysis to look at enrollment trends based on child characteristics. Um, and we previewed that um, last week um, to the House and Senate Ed Committees. We move on to administration. So this is the, the final section we looked at was the administration of the pre-K program. And we found that many, but, but not all, many of the stakeholders who we spoke with supported the idea of administering <coughs> pre-K uh, through a centralized uh, single agency. But we did hear other suggestions. So um, some stakeholders preferred to continue with joint agency and felt that having both agencies involved would bring different perspectives into the pre-K administration. And then we also heard the idea of possibly creating a new standalone agency that would be responsible for administering pre-K and possibly other early childhood programs in addition. And many of the stakeholders who we spoke with supported the idea of centralizing contracting and payments at the state level. They thought that would be an important step towards streamlining the program administration. And then one other idea we heard was to um, think about devolving responsibility for the delivery and monitoring of the program to the regional level. And so this would essentially make pre-K similar to K through 12, where a supervisory union would be responsible for providing a quality education to the pre-K students within its boundaries, either in a public setting that they provide or by contracting with private partners to provide um, pre-K in those settings, similar to tuitioning out students at the K through 12 level. And then when we looked at the literature, we found that there was really no single, one-size-fits-all, best model. Yeah, for we were looking for that. <laughs> that would be great, be great to find. Um, but yeah, there was no one perfect model for administering pre-K. Um, and it really will depend on the state's political context and history <coughs> and background. But that said, experts have pointed to benefits of consolidation. Uh, so for example, making communication easier and strengthening communication between those involved with the program, uh, simplifying the monitoring efforts, and then just overall reducing um, duplicative efforts or redundancies and increasing efficiency. And so those were the core findings from our interim report that we wanted to share. Are there other questions or anything you can clarify? I'm just wondering, uh, probably goes back a few uh, bullets ago, but did you find that people responded in any differently to what we call childhood development or childhood education? Did people make that differentiation sometimes that early childhood development is different than early childhood education? That is something that some of the stakeholders brought up. And for example, in some cases where um, we heard the recommendation to continue with joint agency, um, that was part of the rationale, was that it brings in the perspective from those who may be more involved with early childhood services 
alongside those who are involved with um, more of the educational system services. It would be interesting how parents respond to that. Mm. Yeah. Might be question, one of those, what do you call those questions that sort of evolve out of your core of the group? Right. Right. Similar structure. Similar. <laughs> Kicking and screaming, you're going to make us researchers. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. My question is actually just somewhat technical. Um, I'm assuming the use of many, some, et cetera, very non quantifiable um, numbers is just because you're not ready to tell us the real numbers? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, is 11, 11 entities say, or interview said one agency and six said a standalone agency, or is there another reason you didn't use the actual quantifiable number? So, so it was a relatively small sample. We talked to 13 people, and you know, we want to protect the confidentiality of those who we spoke with. Um, and so by kind of not providing the most specific numbers, um, you know, that lets people feel free to talk with us without thinking that they specifically are going to be identified. Yeah. And, and as I'm a quantitative researcher by training, and I would say that with a sample so small, it would be. Oh, jargon over. I, so, yes, thank you. So, you know, just when we're thinking about, um, you know, if we're thinking about quantifying how many said this and how many said that, the overall sample size is very small. There's only 13. Um, and so I would say that um, you wouldn't want to infer too much by saying, oh, this percent of the sample said this, because one person changing their mind could actually um, make a big difference. Yeah. But it's a good question. Well, you know your sample size is that small. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. I, sorry. And you probably did say it somewhere. So, rolling way back to almost the beginning of your presentation, mm -hmm. I think I heard you say that you were interested in children who might be disadvantaged, whether by income or living or rural uh, or living in the country, being rural. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you consider um, rural children disadvantaged. So considering I live in a, a very rural part of the NEK, um, I'd say I don't. Um, in so far as um, resources can be more sparse, um, yes. So, 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 ge so it's more of a geography thing. It's not specific to the characteristics of the children themselves. But for example, in the other study that we just presented on last week, um, we were seeing that in the 16-17 school year, there were supervisory unions with as few as zero. Um, pre-qualified pre-k programs within that boundary of the supervisory union and as many as 23 so understanding what does access and equity look like in those supervisory unions where you have zero one two three pre-k programs of public or private available to kids um, I think is a really real question yeah rural communities kids are more like they are. Yes, absolutely. There are a lot of change the head start that isolation is one of their criteria. Right. Yes. And so, and when, again, when you're talking about the private pre K programs, you're talking about the private pre K programs that the school is providing some money to. We're talking about publicly pre qualified pre K programs. So, private programs who have become pre qualified. Um, through the pre-qualification process and are eligible to provide pre-K services. Yeah. And the, and the thank you for coming here and you made her go why? Our world is education. Our world is childcare. Yeah. And at the beginning of this legislative session we had a report from building bright futures and one of the first things they said is we need to clarify the oversight and organization we ignored that and um, did a great bill <laughs> to try to make some um, address some of the um, issues in RCCFAP system um, so I keep looking at the kinds of things around the systems level mm -hmm. um, that we seem to have made changes and we astutely 
did not use the word pre-K. Because for us, pre-K means, on some level, you're funded by the education fund. Mm -hmm. And we're not always sure what the difference is in terms of um, Anne's Child Care Center on hour 13. And I should say that so my research background is um, not just specific to education, so it's child care as well, so it's early childhood in general. Um, and I'd say that it's not a unique position. Um, I do research in Connecticut as well, and they're actually one of the states that has chosen to have an office of early childhood at the state level, as well as Massachusetts, where Aaron lives. Um, they have a you know early childhood office. And, um, but I think that that is, that is the question, and it's definitely stuff that our, our, our partners at CDD have brought up, right, is um, if we're interviewing or, um, these pre-K providers, are they even going to understand what you say when you say you're 10 hours a week of pre-K because it's not necessarily that cut and dry. For sure, we understand, yeah. Um, I'm still a little flummoxed by the um, on, on the quality about the research. Uh, I'm just looking at your more detailed um, explanation from your PowerPoint about uh, there being no or limited relationships between early childhood credentials and child outcomes. Um, and so I just, well, I guess, would encourage you to have some more discussions with Reva about that because mm -hmm. we definitely have differences of presentation about that kind of information. It would be helpful for us to understand the differences between research that CDD has done on this and research that you're doing on this. Actually, in conversations with Melissa, um, she has indicated that, that this is what she was expecting. Um, so that, um, so again, to the point that where we had a conversation around how there is research that has shown that having a child development associate um, is more related to child outcome, increased child outcomes. So we have had these conversations with CDD. Okay. We actually sat down in a meeting, uh, they, well, they received the report beforehand, and then we sat down and discussed the findings all together in the same room with um, Kate, uh, Reba, and Melissa. Okay. Um, and as far as I know, now I'm, I'm not speaking for Reba <laughs> or for Melissa, but I do know that we have had that conversation, and it seemed like we were on the same page there, that this kind of, they were not surprised by these findings. And maybe we'll have other conversations with them. Thank you. No, I mean, if I may, just mm -hmm. along those lines, I know I specifically asked Rita about on the educational background of, of uh, child care people, you know, what, what was the difference between somebody with, a, uh, let's say, an eighth grade education, a high school education, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree. And of course, nobody could give any definitive uh, number. But I was trying to get at was, was it a difference of 1%? 5%, 20%, you know, in terms of improvement in the outcomes. And I didn't get that. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, I was interested in one of your last bullets there, you know, along this line, is that how, how would we come up with something along those lines? Because, I mean, basically, the overarching comment from Reba and others in the department were, it's just, there's a uh, tremendous amount of evidence that says the higher the educational level, the better the outcome. Higher the educational level of the presenter or the person in charge of the children. Uh, it, but hearing what you're saying, there doesn't seem to be the correlation that, uh, that I've been led to believe there is. Okay. Yeah, I think it also depends on, on how, and this is, you know, it depends on how you're defining the education level and what you're looking at. So there may be a difference if you get to a certain level. So once you get to your child development associate, you know, the, what is the coursework that you've been getting? You've gotten a solid understanding of um, human development, child development, um, working with young kids. It's really focused around the early care setting. Um, but when you get um, licensure, it, 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 you know, once you get to the point, if you, you could have gotten licensure in early childhood, but you never have been in a pre-K classroom, right? So I think that there's, I think it really depends. There's a lot more to the story than just what's that certification. It kind of gets to the question around proficiency-based, right? Like, what are those things that you're actually receiving when you're in those programs? And I think 
sticking off the top of my head now, but with a child development associate, I think you have a lot more canned, this is a, you know what you're getting, versus when you're talking about some of these other certifications, which may not be showing the same associations that you would expect, but the what's behind those is a lot more varied. Um, and so maybe that's that's behind what, what we found in the literature. Thank you. Thank you, if I may. I do appreciate that sort of elaboration. This is, I mean, I will admit, I was struck by this too. And, and so, you know, I have not had those in-depth conversations with you, but it is complicated. I think there are issues related to educational um, outcomes, which I think is what you're looking at here, as opposed to some of the more broad child development outcomes that we were also talking about. But I do think this is, would be a very fruitful area to have more conversation. I think it's really important. I just want to commend the, the you know, the researchers for giving us this preliminary report. The hard part is to come. They still have to make recommendations. Um, and so I think for me, this was one of those areas that struck me as something we need to better understand, have more conversations. You may know that uh, uh, the issue of the education requirements with respect to child care is a fairly uh, um, complex and controversial issue. And so I think it really does warrant more conversation. And so I do want to sort of confirm that the comments that you've made that I think it, we do need to dive a little deeper into this and see what it actually means. But again, I look forward to your recommendations uh, to, to figure out where we want to go with this. And I think we can add, so, um, you know, one of the, the way that we try to focus, because there's a lot of research out there on all of these topics, and so to focus on kind of the context of um, the public pre -K, publicly funded pre-K, um, so what we can do is maybe, it sounds like this is probably a really good area for us to go back and do a little bit more exploration. So what we can do is explore more, what are those different delineations of CDA versus not a CDA, or an associate's degree versus not an associate's degree. In the context of Vermont, the question is really around licensure, right? Teacher licensure, do you have our certification? Um, and do you have that level of education? Um, and because that's a degree requirement as part of the legislation. So what we can do is go back and maybe explore a little bit more across the span of education level um, and then uh, include that in our final report. And what I would hope is that if you find things that based on what is in the legislation create barriers or in fact create unanticipated or undesirable outcomes that just because when we wrote this we said this then maybe we let go of that or maybe we add on to it um, uh, you know I mean I guess I, um, I I would hope that you are not constrained in your recommendations by, um, this is what the law says, so this is what we're going to build on the law. Um, it may mean changing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, Paul, oh, thank you. That was any commitment, Carl. Um, when I look at your more detailed thing, uh, um, it talks about experts have, uh, it's just commended. I, Remember, there are 13 of them. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, are they the, that's what no, I'm No, no, the experts are the from the research. They, they would be researchers that are going to. Yeah, they, so the that's who the experts are. Yeah. The researchers that, okay. So, and who are yet others have raised? concerns that public settings will attract and retain the best teachers via superior salaries and benefits. Who are they? Uh, so, so those are the researchers as well. Um, and in some cases, it might be the same researcher who is writing about They may be the experts. OK. The pros and okay. cons. Right. And the, um, excuse me. 
I just want to commend you again because I appreciate that question and I will admit as I read it, having lived through this for a few years, right, I actually tried to guess well, who said which things and honestly I think you all did a really good job and just so you know of, of summarizing and putting forward many of the things I've heard over the past three years. So using that example, I have heard folks talk about that question and issue and I've heard that from providers, I've heard that um, from you know people in our staff at CDD that one of the disparities is salaries and that um, it is challenging for our uh, private pre-K providers to pay the same salaries that public schools pay. So that is one of the issues they do highlight quite clearly in this internal report and I think it's real. And, and we just finished the child care. Right. Clearly, we could be keeping here for a few hours <laughs> and asking lots of questions. Um, and thank you very much. But a, a, a large cadre um, of our committee needs to be somewhere else by 430. And we have a commitment to making sure they can do that. So I want to say thank you very much. And we look forward to the um, next chapter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.